Could everyone quiet down, please? All right, we're about to start here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's debate, Was Jesus Raised from the Dead? My name is Chris Glasser. I am the president of the Secular Student Alliance here at Western Michigan University. Uh, a year ago, Rachel Christie came to us and asked if we wanted to partner with them in a debate. We excitedly said yes, and here we are a year later. I'm proud to introduce tonight, debating against the proposition that Jesus wrote, rose from the dead, John W. Loftus. Mr. Loftus is a former Christian minister with a bachelor's degree from Great Lakes Christian College, two master's degrees from Lincoln Christian University, and a master's of theology degree from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, with half of those hours studying under the well-known Christian apologist William Lane Craig. Mr. Loftus has written several books, including Why I Became an Atheist, The Christian Delusion, and The Outsider Test for Faith. He also writes on his website, Debunking Christianity. Please help me welcome to the stage, John W. Loftus. Thanks, Chris. My name is Mark Klosterman. Uh, I'm a student president of Rashu Christie here at Western Michigan University. Uh, it's a pleasure of mine to uh, just see so many people come out to this event. A lot of uh, months have been put into the preparation to have this come about. A lot of paperwork, um, a lot of unforeseen challenges, so thank you for coming out tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our other speaker for tonight, Mr. Abdu Murray. Abdu is a former Muslim. He's now turned Christian. He received his bachelor's in arts and psychology from the University of Michigan. His Juris Doctor at the University of Michigan Law School. He's named several times the best lawyers in America and Michigan's super lawyer. He's a scholar in residence of Christian thought and apologetics at the Josh McDowell Institute of Oklahoma Wesleyan University. He's authored two books and works as the North American director and speaker at Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Would you please help me in welcoming to the stage, Mr. Abdu Murray. It's also a pleasure of mine to introduce to you guys the moderator for tonight, the Honorable Judge Alexander Lipsy. Judge Lipsy is the court judge since 2007. He's the Michigan State Representative serving from 2000 to 2006. He's also a Kalamazoo City Count Commission and Vice Mayor serving in the past. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Physics from Kalamazoo College here in town. Uh, he's also received his Juris Doctor at the University of Michigan. So would you please help me in welcoming to the stage the Honorable Judge Alexander Lipsy. Thank you. Thank you and welcome uh, to this discussion. Um, there are a couple things that I do need to make sure I cover. Not the least, not the least of which being uh, that this is uh, an opportunity for us to have uh, this rather profound uh, conversation. And I emphasize the word conversation because uh, this is, I guess, as I was saying to one of our speakers, an opportunity for us to understand that uh, we can disagree, but we can have conversations that uh, bring us closer together in terms of, of understanding each other and uh, recognizing kind of where people are coming from. Uh, my pastor uh, at uh, North Presbyterian Church likes to talk about uh, faith and the fact that faith, uh, the opposite of faith is, is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. Uh, if you certainly know something, then you have no room for faith. Uh, but if you doubt, then you're open to faith. And this is an opportunity for us to have that discussion, that conversation that hopefully will bring us closer together in terms of how uh, we live our lives and how we live in this community. Um, basically, uh, th at this particular point, the format, I believe, is in your um, program. Uh, we will have uh, the opening statements uh, followed by 
uh, rebuttal time. Uh, there will be something called cross-examination uh, and closings, and then we will have opportunity for questions and answers uh, a little bit later in the process. But uh, you're not here to hear me. You're here to hear our speakers. So uh, with that, we will begin uh, with Abdu and uh, his presentation. Make sure to, there we go. Well, thank you, Your Honor, for that introduction and for, the, for all of you for coming. Uh, thank you for the Sec Secular Student Alliance, uh, Rashio Christie, and all who are involved in this. And John, I want to thank you especially for agreeing to do this debate with me. It's an honor to share the stage with you. I met John about six or seven years ago, maybe even longer than that, in Providence, Rhode Island. I was at an ETS conference, which is just a fancy, nerdy Christian conference. Um, and after that was another conference, an apologetics conference. And a friend of mine, Paul Copan, said, hey, Abdu, are you staying for that apologetics conference afterward? And I said, yeah, I actually am. He says, do you have a room with an extra bed? I said, yeah, got a room, extra bed. Do you have a car to get around in? I said, yeah, Paul, whatever you need. Room, bed, car, you got it. He goes, great, John Loftus is coming. He needs a place to stay. It was my, do my honor to actually, <laughs> it was my honor to host him. We got to know each other a little bit, and we got to know each other a little bit more today. And uh, we were engaging on some topics, and uh, I asked, oh, John, do you have something written down? He says, yes, I have my book. I said, great. And he said, 20 bucks. Um, I'm kidding, actually. I think I was remembering it this, this, this evening. John actually offered it to me, and I insisted on paying for it, and he gratefully, um, I'm glad he did accept that. And I've been uh, grateful for that. Why, did Jesus rise is the question we're talking about, but the question you have to ask yourself, and it's a rhetorical question, is why are you here? Some of you are here to see John beat me. Some of you are here to see me beat John. Some of you are actually on the fence. Why are you here? Now, in prior debates, and I assume today to some degree, John will go into the idea of confirmation bias. What confirmation bias is, is that people tend, from different perspectives, to look at evidence differently. People who want, it to believe, to want to believe it one way will look at it and discount some things and affirm other things that help them to conform to their worldview. That's how confirmation bias works. Everyone is subject to confirmation bias. I know John has spent some time chiding Christians for being guilty of confirmation bias and not really examining the other evidence. And he said in prior debates that if you hear him as a Christian, you'll just discount what he says because you don't want to believe what he has to offer. The reality is, is that everyone, everyone in this room, you, me, John Loftus is subject to confirmation bias. Some of us want to be atheists, like philosopher Thomas Nagel. We hate the idea of God and so cling to atheism despite its problems. Or we want Christianity to be false because of some moral choice we want to make, have made, or trouble in the church, whatever it is. There's a million reasons to be a disbeliever, and there's a million reasons to be a believer. And most of them are personal. Now, <clears throat> John might say, I was once a Christian philosopher, or a Christian um, who came to, uh, lost my faith because I looked at the evidence, overcame my confirmation bias, saw the evidence, saw it was lacking. I have two responses to this. We're both still subject to this. I make a living based on preaching the gospel. That's what I do. John makes at least part of his living, um, if not all of it, on his many books that he's written, Debunking Christianity. He's got a website called Debunking Christianity. So we both have a vested interest in looking at the evidence the way we'd like to look at it. But I will tell you this. I didn't come to the faith of Christianity willingly, at least not originally. I was a Muslim, and I very much didn't like the idea of Jesus' death and his resurrection specifically, and the gospel in general. So I didn't want to believe it. But over the course of a long search, I began to see that I thought the evidence was really there. There was going to be consequences to my belief, some bad consequences. One, I'd lose my identity. Two, I had to change my worldview, and that's really hard to do. And three, there'd be other consequences as well. I won't go into that. But I saw the evidence and the strength of it, and it moved me, and it changed my life. But it also was beautiful in its truth, and I thought it was truly beautiful. So my argument for you today about the evidence is this. I think the resurrection best is the best explanation for the evidence of what happened to Jesus based on facts acknowledged by the majority of scholars, Christian and non-Christian, studying the subject. Now, what is that evidence? Well, we have a couple of facts about Jesus that we know about. One is that he was crucified and he died. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think, if I'm not mistaken, John and I actually agree. Jesus died. He thinks he stayed dead. I think he actually died and rose. But we don't disagree on this. Jesus died by crucifixion. So that's the first part. Now, why do I bring that up? Because in order to rise from the dead, 
You've got to be dead first. That's kind of how it works. <clears throat> but the next part is the, is the rub, the appearances. I believe that there is evidence, and the vast majority of scholars studying the subject, Christian and non-Christian, will acknowledge that the disciples and Paul had experiences that, they were con that, they, that convinced them that Jesus had risen from the dead after his crucifixion. What are the sources for this? We have primary sources, we have secondary sources, and these kind of things. I'm going to focus on some sources because we don't have time to focus on all the sources, but here's some sources I want to focus on. One is, some of the, is the Gospels. I think the Gospels, and the majority of uh, scholars will tell you that some of the Gospels have some wonderful evidence in them, first-hand accounts. This is not, uh, oh, I didn't even turn it on, so that, that will help a lot, I think. We have the Gospels. Most scholars will tell you, the majority of scholars will tell you that Mark's Gospel is based on Peter's account, the Apostle Peter's account. Now, I have a friend, his name is J. Warner Wallace. Jim Wallace is a very famous homicide detective. He's famous enough to be on Dateline numerous times because of the number of cold cases he solves. Keith Morrison calls him the evidence whisperer. He was a dyed-in-the-wool hardcore atheist until age 35, I believe it was. Now, he is an expert in, uh, in analyzing whether certain statements are eyewitness testimony or fabrications. And at the age of 35, he employed a technique called forensic statement analysis, and he did it on the Gospel of Mark and have concluded that the Gospel of Mark is indeed based on eyewitness testimony from Peter, among others, he gave his life to Jesus, believing in the resurrection on the strength of that evidence as a dyed-in-the-wool atheist. Next we have the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke has several sources. The majority of scholars will tell you the Gospel of Luke has Paul as one of his sources, the Apostle Paul, who's eyewitness to the resurrection. Q, which is a theoretical source uh, that Mark and uh, sorry that Matthew and Luke drew on, and Mark itself, the Gospel of Mark, which is based on Peter, and it has some eyewitness testimony of its own. Let me give you an example of this. If you look at Luke chapter 24, you see this story of Jesus talking with. Uh, he comes to after his resurrection two disciples on the road to a thing called Emmaus, and in the story, Jesus' identity is, is occluded from them, but Luke goes on out and mentions one person's name. He mentions Cleopas as one of the guys. Now, why does he mention Cleopas? He's not an important disciple. He doesn't have a record after him of anything. Why did he do that? Many scholars will tell you, Richard Baucom as one example, will tell you that the reason why Luke mentions him, and this is one example of this, is because Cleopas told him the story. Cleopas is the eyewitness upon which Luke writes the basis. And if you read it with that in mind, you actually look at the story now and you can begin to see it sounds like Cleopas is telling the story. It's an eyewitness account. And then the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, the majority of scholars will tell you that John's Gospel is based on one of the disciples. Some say it's the Apostle John. Others say it's at least one of the disciples. So we have these accounts. The Gospels tell you about the life the death and the resurrection, every single one of them says this about Jesus, and they're based on these accounts, which result, in, which result from eyewitness accounts. And then we have Paul's testimony. Paul, by his own admission, was a persecutor of the church who became a Christian after having seen with his own eyes the resurrected Jesus. And he says that he converted from that hostility to Christianity based on that. Now, what happens with Paul? It's interesting when you see what, what, uh, what goes on with Paul. He claims to have seen the, the risen Christ. In Galatians, another letter of Paul, Paul goes and says that he spent time, 15 days, with Peter and James. He spends time with them. And spending two weeks with Peter and James, my guess is in 15 weeks, Jesus came up. 15 days. That Jesus came up once in a while. And they didn't change his, 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 uh, his gospel. In other words, he said, I saw him raised. They gave him the right hand of fellowship. He says in the same book that 14 years after his conversion, he went to Jerusalem, saw Peter and James again, but also now John. They discussed the gospel, and he says, and they added nothing to me. They did not change a thing about what I was saying. So he was preaching the risen Christ based on his eyewitness testimony. They were doing the same thing, and they were agreeing on this. Now, you might say, and I'm a lawyer, so I'm a little bit skeptical of these things. I'm a little cynical. Maybe Paul's lying. Maybe Paul didn't go and do this. Maybe Paul didn't get his doctrine and his, his um, eyewitness testimony certified by the disciples of Jesus. I want another witness. We have two. We have Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome is a disciple of Peter. And as a disciple of Peter, he knows Peter. He knows what Peter teaches. Clement says that Paul is on a par. His authority is on par with Peter himself. 
So Clement certifies what Paul said. He could have said Paul's lying. He didn't say it. He said the opposite. Paul is on par with Peter. Then we have Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John, the Apostle John. Polycarp thinks so highly of, of Paul that he calls his letters sacred scripture. So he clearly thinks that Paul and John are teaching the same thing. So we have eyewitnesses, James, Peter, and John. Paul and I witness, they certify their stories, and we have witnesses who certify that the witnesses saw what they saw. Pretty good stuff, I think. Now, what does Paul give us? In addition to his confession through, of, of seeing the risen Christ throughout his letters, we see in 1 Corinthians 15, um, his, the undisputed letter of Paul, 3 through 8, a creed that Paul passes down. Now, if you look at those passages in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8, you see that there's a creed that he passes down. Most scholars think it's a creed that predated Paul's letter by quite some time. It was about three to five years after the crucifixion itself. One scholar, James Dunn, thinks that that creed that was passed down was passed down to within 18 months after Jesus died. Pretty early stuff. You freshmen, and uh, sorry, you seniors and you juniors know, remember the day you first started here? That was three years ago or so. That was a blink. That's the, dif the, uh, the time difference between when this creed, was, when Jesus died and the creed was circulated. And what does the creed say? The creed says that Jesus died according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised. He appeared to Peter or Cephas. Then he appeared to James, then the 12, then the 500, and then to Paul. That was circulating publicly within the Christian community between 18 months and five years after the crucifixion itself. We have tons of great uh, evidence, I think, that people in that era actually were convinced they saw Jesus risen from the dead. Now, we know they believed it with a strong conviction or willing to suffer and die from it. Some, in fact, did actually suffer and die for it. Others were just willing to do that. And we know this based on that history. In fact, so strong is that history that non-Christians, like atheist Gerd Ludemann, not a Christian, he's an atheist, says, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Rudolf Bultmann agreed that historical criticism can establish, quote, the fact that the first disciples came to believe in the resurrection. Paula Fredrickson, who's not a Christian, who's a professor of history out of the University of Boston, I think that she's now actually, or Boston University, she's now at Hebrew University, I believe, she said, the disciples' conviction that they had seen the risen Christ are facts known past doubting. And in fact, in an interview on, with Peter Jennings, she made this statement. I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say, and then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know that as a historian, they must have seen something that convinced them that Jesus was not just a survivor or the twin or whatever it is, but that he was the risen Christ. Pretty good stuff. Now, you might be saying, well, a lot of the testimony comes from Christians. Certainly not these folks. These are all non-Christians who I just quoted to you. But, ah, oh, Peter and James, and these are all Christians. Of course they say this. Well, it would be funny, wouldn't it, if someone saw the risen Jesus, they knew he died, saw him raised, or saw him risen, and he says, follow me. And they're like, nah, no thanks. I don't buy it. That would be a strange thing. You think that they would actually follow Jesus. Why? Because he rose from the dead. And guys who rise from the dead have credibility. But we have something more than that. We have more than just those folks. Let's say you wanted a hostile witness, someone who was a skeptic, who was not only a skeptic, but also someone who hated the church and wanted it destroyed. Now, what if that guy saw the risen Jesus and he converted? Wouldn't that be something? You know, as a trial lawyer, I'll tell you, one of the things you look for as a trial lawyer is that kind of testimony. You find someone who's disputed your case over and over again throughout the whole case, and then they suddenly change their mind based on the evidence they, th that they see, and they say, you know what, you're actually right. Well, my goodness, you put that person on the stand, and you let them sing their song all day and all night, if the judge will let you do it, uh, as long as possible for the jury, you, the jury, to see it, to hear it. We have that kind of testimony in two people, James, Jesus' brother, to one degree, and Paul to a greater degree. The evidence shows that James was a skeptic of his brother Jesus. He didn't believe him. He thought he was, a, he thought he was kind of a kook. I have the references there on the slide. But Paul, oh, but James becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church after seeing the risen Jesus. Now, Paul is, a, is another story altogether. 
Paul hated the church by his own admission and by scholarly consensus. Paul persecuted the Christian church and then he converted based on his claim that he saw the risen Jesus. That's pretty, that's pretty great. That's the kind of that's not testimony that trial lawyers drool over. Now you'd have to invent a highly unlikely story to account for these conversions. Both James and Paul, Paul especially, had every reason not to convert except for the fact that they truly believed that they saw the bodily risen Jesus. Friends, as I bring this closer to a conclusion now, what we've seen is that, one, Jesus died by crucifixion. Not really a matter of dispute. Two, that he appeared bodily to his disciples. We know about the disciples that he appeared to. We see them in the gospel accounts. We see them in Paul's letters. We see that in the earliest tradition of the church, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8, Paul tells us about that creed that got passed down. By the way, you know it's a creed for another reason, too. A couple of reasons that most scholars think it's a creed. One, it has a, has a certain parallelism and a rhyme and a meter, not a rhyme, but a meter to it that shows that it's a creed. It doesn't fit with the Pauline structure of his letter. And so many scholars do believe that it was something that predated Paul himself. Early stuff. Early stuff. So he's crucified. He appeared. And the strength of that appearance, what his disciples saw, was so great that they were willing to suffer and die for that belief. We know, for example, that Paul gave his life in service of that belief. Now, these these are evidences, these are things that the majority of scholars agree on, Christian and non-Christian. These three facts, crucifixion, appearances, and the skeptics converted. These three facts cry out for an explanation. They cry out for one. And I think the best explanation is the resurrection. It accounts for all the data, and it accounts for all the data without being ad hoc or speculative, or sort of you know, just made up out of thin air. Now, does this explanation defy our common experience of the natural world? Well, of course it does. You see, science and our observations through science um, is a marvelous tool for telling us about how nature works when it's left to itself. But a miracle by definition happens when nature is not left to itself. So these other issues, if you say, oh, science disproves these things exist, well, it doesn't even apply in this particular case. I'm a believer in science. It doesn't apply in this case because you're not measuring how nature governs itself. What you're, which, what you're measuring is that against when nature is not left to itself. Now, if you say there's no way nature can't be left to itself, it's got to be left to itself, or miracles are the most highly improbable event possible or explanation possible, what you've done is define your way out of the problem. You basically said there's no way miracles can happen, and so when, when, no matter how much evidence you show me that one did, I won't believe it. Friends, to say that is to succumb to the very confirmation bias that John Lopez would warn you against, I would warn you against. Any explanation has to take into account all of the core facts. Now, John may try to offer other possible explanations, poke holes in that, but they will not be the best explanation. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the best explanation. Thank you. Good job, Abdu. Good job. Uh, I wouldn't want to be facing you as a, as a lawyer, that's for sure. Uh, I'm very honored. Oh, by the way, uh, his description of us uh, sleeping together, I deny it. <laughs> we did not sleep together. Uh, a good friend, uh, and I appreciate him uh, very much. So, let me be in. I'm very honored to be here and uh, happy that somebody actually showed up to watch and listen to our debate. I can't wait to hear what I have to say myself. Uh, I have a lot of ground to cover, and uh, what I don't cover can be read in my books. The, uh, why I became an atheist is my magnum opus, and uh, the, uh, 
Bruce's most recent book is How to Defend the Christian Faith, Advice from an Atheist. Now, if uh, I say something that you disagree with, then further justification is found in my books, and if you want the detailed rebuttals of, to everything he said, they're there as well. <laughs> um, now I want to start by talking about the state of Christian apologetics, and then I'm going to move into the evidence, the so-called evidence for the resurrection, and I'm going to end by tying it all together. Let me begin with a quote from Avi Doulis in his uh, huge book, The History of Apologetics. The 20th century has seen more clearly than previous periods that apologetics stands or falls with the question of method. Now, I'm going to highlight this tonight, something that I don't think very many Christian apologists have considered before. And let's do definitions. Uh, apologetics, defending the Christian faith. Method, developing the most effective strategy for defending the faith. Now, I'm going to argue that all apologetics is special pleading. Everything said in defense of Christianity operates by an unreasonable double standard. Apologists treat Christianity differently than they treat the evidences of all other religions that they reject. Case in point has to do with the method itself. One should first come up with the best method to know which, which religion is true, if there is one. This problem has only recently come to light, and it's significant. In response, apologists are trying to come up with a method after the fact that justifies their faith. Folks, this is just not how you do it, honestly. First comes method, and then the results come as they may. Now, this crisis started in 1953, at least it was called to attention by uh, Bernard Ram in his book, Varieties of Christian Apologetics, 1976. It was commented on by Gordon Lewis. 2000, the debate is still raging with five apologetics views in uh, Stephen Cohen's book. And 2006, Kenneth Boa and Robert uh, Bowman commented on it. And those are only just a few of the books. There's actually a spate of them and hundreds of essays and articles. Let's go through these uh, methods. First, the evidential method. And that, and that is, historical evidence alone is sufficient to believe Jesus arose from the dead and that God exists. Now, I have no boon, bone to pick with this method. It's the only reasonable method for assessing the truth of religious faith. It requires sufficient objective evidence to believe. I just disagree that it leads to Christianity. The kicker is that so do most Christian apologists. It's an admitted failure. And Christian apologists are pointing this out. One, without God, miracles aren't likely. Norman Geisler, a, a proponent of a different method, says the mere fact of the resurrection of Jesus cannot be used to establish the truth that there is a God, for the resurrection cannot even be a miracle unless there already is a God. Lasing's ugly broad ditch, 18th century German critic Gotthold Lasing said, miracles, which I see with my own eyes and which I have opportunity to verify for myself, are one thing. Miracles of which I only know from history that others say uh, that they have seen them uh, are another thing entirely. Bart Ehrman echoes Lacing's thought when he said all that historians can do is show what probably happened in the past. That is the problem inherent in miracles. Miracles by our very definition of the term are virtually impossible events. So miracles by their very nature are always the least probable explanations for what happened. Now deists were actually the first modern evidentialists. Uh, you, you probably know of it because uh, theists believe only there, there's only a creator God. Well, actually, that's the conclusion of a method that they chose, and that method was to, uh, to only believe what was reasonable based on sufficient evidence. And it ended with the rejection of all religious dogma except for the need for a creator. After Darwin's origin of species, most deists became atheists because that's where the evidence leads. So we already have an example of evidence, and it leads there. Classical method is another method, one that Norman Geisler helped to pioneer in, uh, in the last uh, you know, few decades. Uh, but what, what about the... Let's see. There we go. Yeah, first, you argue to the existence of God, and then you consider the arguments. Okay, well, there we go. go. But do theistic arguments work? I mean, if you have to first argue that God exists, do they work? Well, two of the greatest living Christian apologists are Alvin Plantinga and Richard Swinburne. Plantinga has admitted that theistic arguments don't work, saying, I don't know of an argument for Christian belief that seems very likely to convince one who doesn't already accept its conclusion. If Christian beliefs are true, then the most satisfactory way to hold them will not be as the conclusions of argument. Richard Swinburne specifically rejects the moral argument to God's existence, saying, I cannot see any force in an argument to the existence of God from the existence of morality. Another Christian apologist of note is John Feinberg. He wrote, I am not convinced that any of the traditional arguments for God's existence succeeds. 
Now, these are Christians saying these things. These are top-notch Christians. Now, if they don't think these arguments work, why should any of us? It's not just me saying this. It's they who are saying this. And even if you do get to a God, which one? We get to a deist God. We get to Allah. We get to a non-personal force, an evil God, a scientific God who is watching over us like rats in a maze. It's just not good enough. Now, the only thing it does admit is that miracles are possible. Uh, now, I, as an atheist, admit miracles are possible, so it doesn't get them anything. What we want to know is whether they happen. And so it ends up being nothing more than a dressed-up ev evidentialism, the very thing that classical apologists want to avoid because of where it leads. Then there's the press, and there's a, let's see what I, yeah. Then there's pre the presuppositional method, another method that is currently being debated, where the evidence, um, I'm getting you lost. The evidence for the resurrection can only be accepted through the lens of Christian assumptions. I must have turned two pages here. That's disappointing. Here it is. It's all my own fault, not yours. I want to blame you, but I can't. But where do these assumptions come from? Um, how is it possible to start with assumptions without first looking at the evidence? The evidence must come first. That makes the assumptions carry all the weight as evidence. Consistency means allowing Muslim assumptions as their evidence or Mormon assumptions as their evidence. This non-method tacitly admits there isn't sufficient evidence to believe in the resurrection, otherwise it never would have been concocted. And in, in the end, it just begs the question. Every Christian apologist who rejects this method will say that. It just begs the question. Four, the Reformed method. It's, uh, it's, in this position is that it's reasonable to believe in God and the resurrection without the need for and or the existence of sufficient objective evidence. Now, who in their right mind would say such a thing? This is another admission by apologists themselves that there isn't sufficient objective evidence to believe, for if it existed, then this non-method would never have been concocted. And in the end, it actually, yeah, I, I'm, okay. In the end, this method requires psychic uh, abilities, because apparently there's a spiritual world that can tell you what happened three days after Jesus was crucified. You might as well just hire a medium to tell you. And that's the kind of method this is. Then there's the fetism method. That's faithism. And that is the idea that private and subjective experiences of the risen Jesus provide good reasons to believe. But private subjective experiences are only evidence of private subjective experiences. They are only evidence of private subjective states of the mind. They say nothing about the objective world. I don't mean to... Um Insult anybody, but this is a method of insanity. Insane people walking in psych wards who say they think that they're Jesus use this same method. And it's, and in the end, it's an unreliable method as a historical as a way to, to figure out what happened in, in three days after Jesus was uh, crucified. Uh, private subjective experiences cannot tell us if historical evidence shows Jesus resurrected. Just think of Custer's last stand. Is there any way to know what happened at Custer's last stand except looking at the evidence? And you'll know what I'm talking about. Lastly, the cumulative method. Now, this method is a, is a recent one, and it puts all the other methods together. It says, let's use a little bit of, the, of, of all the others. And so in this uh, idea, the, uh, I'm quoting from Wayne House and Dennis Jowers. The apologist needs to be able to employ different approaches in different contexts. Every person will react and be reached differently, so there's no one approach that will work every time. Again, who would ever say such a thing? Apologists are searching for a method that works to convince others rather than one that helps us arrive at the truth. That's the context of what they were writing. It's exhibit A in revealing the truth about apologetics. The goal is to persuade. The method is special pleading. Whatever works is what they'll adopt. It's the warp and woof of Christian apologists. And I used to be a Christian apologist, and so I actually know what I'm talking about. The cumulative method, however, is like mixing oil and water. I'd like to see someone actually harmonize evidentialism with the classical method with presuppositionalism and fetism. It cannot be done. It's also got a leaky bucket problem. Since they all have gaping holes in them, things I've mentioned earlier, then putting them together doesn't stop, then putting them together doesn't stop the leaks. What's really going on with the cumulative method is that proponents merely agree on the conclusion. And that's it. What we see here are Christians struggling to develop a method that supports their prior faith rather than developing an objective method that leads to the truth about religions. And as you can see, they struggle precisely 
because they reject evidentialism. So let's rehearse. Evidentialism and admitted failure. I mean, at least that's the problem that people are developing other methods because. I mean, you wouldn't see any other method arise if the evidential method worked. Classical uh, method back to uh, evidentialism because it doesn't really help to say you got a God. It just it only admits that the miracles are possible. Presuppositionalism. Oh, a reformed uh, like, out of order. We mentioned that psychic ability, question begging, fetism, the method method of insanity, and cumulative. Uh, case is faith in search of a method. This is what you get with Christian apologetic methods, and that's why it's in crisis today. Now, it's not me saying this, although it is me saying this. It's Christian apologists themselves. You read the literature, you see what they're debating in, in, these, uh, in these books about a methodology, and you'll see that they're actually struggling for a way to justify their faith rather than looking at a good method and seeing what results from it. So the kicker. Since there are six major methods, any, then any given one of them is rejected by 83% of the apologists, if we grant for the moment that they all have the equivalent amount of defenders. That means 83% of the apologists reject the need for and or the existence of sufficient objective evidence. Now I propose a method. Oh yeah, well, what, what would you say if Mormons, Mormon apologists had that same result? Well, I've actually proposed a method, it's called the outsider test for faith. That the only way to test religious faith is from the perspective of an outsider, applying the same consistent level of reasonable skepticism to them all. And I've defended it in my book. And uh, I suppose that, that when they take that test, they're not going to actually like what, they res what the result is. Sorry. <clears throat> so, do this. Let's do the resurrection of Jesus. <clears throat> Assume you've never heard about Jesus or Christianity, and that Abdul is a missionary from China preaching yin yang a newly discovered religion. Be become outsiders. Become outsiders for the first time in your lives. <clears throat> and why do you do that? Because it's the only way to dispassionately evaluate your culturally inherited religious faith because we seek to confirm rather than disconfirm our beliefs. Abdu predicted that one. But he's right. And now why do this? Because we depend on familiarity. And here's an example of what I mean. If you're a Christian, you see nothing bizarre about a gospel story involving one member of a Trinitarian God who came down to earth by being born of a virgin who was 100% God, yet 100% man, to be killed so that the other two members of the Trinity could forgive people who believed that story, and then was raised from the dead and ascended into the sky to return to the Trinitarian throne, bringing back to reign with him the sinless man Jesus, who is now forever joined with him at the hip. Or do you? You certainly would if that was the first time you ever heard it, because that's what theologians have concluded. We depend on culture. We are products of our times and indoctrinated into our cultures. Culture isn't even something we see unless we focus on it, for cultures allow us to see in the first place. Cultures are the very lens through which we see the world. And ours are dominated by Christianity. And because our brains lie to us. Cognitive biases get in the way of evaluating your religious faith. The mother of all cognitive biases is confirmation bias, which is a strong tendency to search for data and or interpret existing data in ways that confirm one's prior beliefs. The brain only cares if what it concludes helps it survive. The brain evolved to act this way for self-preservation purposes. It maintains and defends its beliefs, its beliefs so that you can survive as a social creature since you need others to survive. You will, depend, you will defend the beliefs of your social group in order to stay within the safety net of your social group, irrespective of whether those beliefs are true or not. There's a massive amount of solid research supportive of these undeniable facts. So, what would it, given what I've just said, what would it take for you to believe in Abdu's yin yangianity? It would take an overwhelming amount of strong historical evidence to overcome our concrete personal experience that dead men stay dead. Now, do you, if you thought that he gave you that, listen to what I've got to say. Let's talk about empirical evidence. Is there any? None. There is no empirical evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Because it supposedly happened in the ancient pre-scientific past in a lone part of the planet before investigative reporters, videos, and cell phones. 
Where's the, where's the textual evidence? There is none. That is, let me clarify, there are no original texts. We have, we have none. We must wait until the fourth century to get any completed manuscripts. They contain forgeries like the pastoral letters, the ending of Mark. You ever read the ending of Mark? It's not there in the original. Second Peter is one of those forgeries. It's, not this, it's, it's too complicated Greek for a fisherman, and it doesn't match with First Peter. And it ex excludes other Christian writings like the Judaizers. We, don't know, we know nothing about the Judea Judaizers, but Paul was continually battling with them, and the Gnostics. And Bart Ehrman has a couple books on these topics like Lost Scriptures and Lost Christianities. They're there. Those things are there, but they were excluded. Where's the first-hand testimonial experience or uh, te uh, evidence? There is none. There were no eyewitnesses to the resurrection, uh, apart from his convoluted, uh, if that's called evidence. <laughs> um, no eyewitnesses saw Jesus arise from the dead. You, you don't deny that, do you? No one was there. No one was there to see and say, I saw Jesus come out of that tomb. Nobody was there. No one could say that. Now, there were no eyewitnesses either that, that wrote anything. No one wrote anything who saw Jesus arise from the dead. We do, we do not have anything written directly by Jesus himself or his original disciples. All supposed testimonies of the resurrection of Jesus are reported to us by others, which is considered inadmissible and court judged because it's hearsay evidence. Subsequent gospel writers plagiarized upon Mark, the first gospel, so the gospel stories in, of Jesus' of Jesus's resurrection stand on Mark's gospel alone. Luke and Matthew and John borrowed from Mark. The thing is that why that's important is because at the end of Mark's gospel, there isn't a sequence where Jesus shows himself alive after dying. And if Peter was the originator of the Mark's gospel, then Peter didn't tell that story now, did he? There's no chance to question him. You know, you've got to question somebody. That's why hearsay is is not allowed in the courtroom. How do we really know what they actually testified to? Did they actually see the risen Jesus as claimed? Did they all tell the same story? Did any of them recant later? We know enough about the Mormon uh, religion to say, well, some of them recanted later, but we don't about um, of the Jesus uh, story. Paul is the only writer to claim that he's seen the risen Jesus, and his letters are the earliest testimony, and on the Damascus Road, he never claimed to have actually seen or touched Jesus. He specifically said it was a visionary experience, and they had plenty of visionary experiences and revelations. He says he had the Lord's Supper revealed to him in a vision. He even said that the gospel itself was revealed to him in a, religion, in a vision. The book of Revelation was dictated uh, to seven letters to seven churches in the first two in the chapters 2 and 3, and that was delivered in a vision. Now, if someone came up to you tomorrow and said, I had a vision, and I got seven letters to church, seven churches, would you believe that? Those are private subjective experiences, and there's no reason to believe them. Let me go on. Where's the prophetic evidence? There is none. Looks like i got to go faster here. Now, if you want to see that defended, you, get, you need to read my books, because I've got to move on. There is no prophetic evidence. I defy someone to come up with one statement in the Old Testament that is specifically fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that can be legitimately understood as a prophecy and singularly points to Jesus as the Messiah using today's historical, grammatical, hermeneutical method. method and I, I claim it cannot be done. There's no, no prophecy of a Trinitarian God, no prophecy of an incarnation of a virgin birth, no prophecy of a dying Messiah. The suffering servant is about Israel. And the Psalms are only devotional prayers. They're not, they were not intended to be a prophecy. They're taken out of context when the New Testament uses them. And corroborative evidence. Where's the corroborative evidence? There is none. Again, you know how many times this, this phrase pops up? There is none? A lot. Because it's true. Nothing is said. Nothing, we have nothing from contemporaries. We don't have anything written by the Jewish leaders or by the Romans that mentions Jesus, the content of his preaching, why he was killed, or what they thought about claims that he had been resurrected. Now, wouldn't you want to know, when assessing the truth of whether Jesus rose from dead, what they said? We don't have that evidence. You know they said something because they weren't converted. We just don't have that evidence. Either it was squelch or it wasn't available. But wouldn't you want to know what they said? They said something. And no corroborative evidence of bizarre stories of zombies, earthquakes, and eclipses. We have no independent reports that the veil of the temple was torn into at Jesus' birth or death, nor, any dark, nor that darkness came over the whole land from noon till three, nor that the sun stopped shining, nor that there was an earthquake as, as death with another violent one the day he rose from the grave, nor that the saints were raised from, from uh, death at his resurrection, went into the holy city, and appeared to many people and were never heard from again. Could these events really have 
occurred without subsequent Roman rabbinic or rabbinic literature mentioning them. These silences are telling. So let's re re review. No empirical evidence, no original text, no first-hand testimony evidence, no prophetic evidence, no, no, uh, no, uh, no corroborative evidence. Now, case in point, the Jews. They, they were beloved of God. They believed in God. They believed God does miracles. They were there in the day. They hoped for a Messiah. They knew their prophecies, and they didn't believe. Eight million Jews existed in those days, and what we have is very, very few Jews actually converted. So it's that Paul had to go to the, uh, the, uh, the, the Gentiles to get convert converts because the Jews wouldn't convert. Now, if you think that that counts, uh, then you should uh, consider that. And I just have one thing to say. This is, a book, this is a book written by a Jew, not an atheist. It's the best thing out there. So if you think that believing in God leads you to have more uh, um, of a desire to believe, then think again. This is Michael Alters, The Resurrection, A Critical um, Inquiry. One last okay. thing. <laughs> well, I have 10 minutes of, of uh, rebuttal, so you may want to cover it at that right. particular point. All right. Uh, I'm not good at time. Thank you so much. As I indicated, we each have 10 minutes uh, for a rebuttal, and then we'll have uh, seven-minute cross-examinations afterwards. Uh, I'll do. Thank you, John. For, uh, am I on? Great. Thank you, John, for that. I uh, appreciate it. Um, uh, someone has to ask, where does one begin? Uh, but let me just say this. Literally none of the evidence I presented was addressed. Literally none of it. I presented that there were three facts that scholars, the majority of scholars, actually agree upon, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, that Jesus died by crucifixion, not controversial, that Jesus appeared to his disciples, or that the disciples believed, I should say, that they saw something that convinced them that Jesus had risen from the dead, and that conviction was so strong that they're willing to suffer and die for it, that Paul believed he had seen a bodily raised Jesus, a bodily raised Jesus, and that changed him from a staunch enemy of the gospel into its greatest champion. James, the brother of Jesus, was a skeptic and becomes the head of the Jerusalem church. I presented to you a couple of things you see from the gospel uh, uh, evidence. That from the gospel of Mark, which is based on Peter and other eyewitness testimony, to the gospel of Luke, which is based on Paul, who was himself an eyewitness, who also draws from Q, who draws from Mark. That's not a, a problem. I don't think that's a problem in any way, shape, or form. Uh, who, of course, draws his information from Peter himself, and then eyewitnesses as well. And we have indicia of that in the Gospel of Luke. And John, John, who many scholars believe, most scholars actually believe, was based on the eyewitness testimony of one of Jesus' disciples. Now, having seen that, and then Paul's letters, the certifications, the cross certifications, we come to the firm conclusion that Jesus died by crucifixion that he appeared, there was an appearance, some kind of event that convinced his disciples he was alive again, and that it was so strong that the Apostle Paul, an enemy, became a believer. That's pretty strong evidence. I think it's strong evidence. That's the kind of thing I would put on the stand, especially when we have this forensic statement analysis which shows, I think, that there are first-hand accounts within those Gospels themselves. None of that was addressed. There was a whole lot of objection thrown up, and it's not even remotely possible to answer all of them. It was going like a tobacco auctioneer over here uh, in terms of how fast he was going. I realized that not, that's not fair. I mean, I realized that time is the essence, and I myself was rushing through my own presentation. But it's tough to respond to all of those. Let me respond to some of them, give you an example of a couple of things that I think are just um, worthy of response. The first thing is this. His definition of miracle is just simply fallacious, and it's a private definition. I think he shares it with Bart Ehrman, but he defined a miracle as the least likely explanation or event possible, and therefore any other naturalistic explanation would do. If you have something that's even remotely possible, naturalistically speaking, that's infinitely more probable than a miracle because a miracle by definition is the least likely event you could have. Now, is that really true? If you were an outsider, and you came to the ta table 50-50, not having this sort of ad hoc definition of miracle that it's the least likely event, but maybe one of the possible events. And until I see evidence for it, I won't believe it. 
you won't have this sort of high, incredibly high hurdle to have to reach over to. You won't have that. You'll have a true, unbiased opinion. If there's enough evidence for a miracle, I'll believe it. It doesn't have to assume God's existence. I don't think that's the case. In fact, the historian can look at the data and say, here's the data we see. And historians of every stripe have done that, and they've seen that. What is the best explanation for the data that Jesus rose? What's the cause of the rising? Well, that's a different story. Was it God? Which God? I don't know. What I can tell you is, based on the evidence, the most reasonable conclusion is that this guy rose from the dead. John asks, did anybody actually see him rise from the dead? We have a statement in the law about circumstantial evidence. I don't have to go outside to know it's raining if it, in fact, is raining. I can walk in, having it not rain, see somebody walk in with an with a umbrella, uh, umbrella that's wet, a raincoat that's wet, and have that person say, it's raining. I have a reasonable conclusion that it's raining. A guy dies, guy's alive three days later. Ergo resurrection. I don't have to see it. I can see the, 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 the living body. That's a good enough uh, reason to believe in a resurrection. I don't have to see it. So miracles are not as defined uh, in, in the book of miracles according to John Loftus. I think that there's plenty of reasons to believe in them separately. But let's look at these other things he talked about. Just a couple of things and then I'll move on. He talked about the Jews not believing. This is an interesting one to me because the Christian faith was made up of Jews first. And if Acts 21 is to, believed, is to be believed, there's thousands of Jews who actually did believe. But why didn't they believe? If he says there should have been much more people who believed that the evidence was that strong, why didn't they believe? You know what? Let me give you an answer. I don't know. And you know who else doesn't know? John Loftus. No clue. People disbelieve things for all kinds of reasons and have nothing to do with the evidence. People start smoking. Intelligent people begin to smoke. They know two things. It's harmful and addictive. And they start anyway. They do things contrary to evidence that will kill them. So the evidence could have been very strong for the resurrection and people disbelieved it for whatever reasons. Let me venture some. We know, for example, about the Bar Kokhba rebellion, is that early after the Christian movement started, a number of Jews, one guy named Bar Kokhba actually set himself up as a messiah. And the Messianic Jews, the budding movement, would not fight the Romans under the, under the banner of a false messiah. So they abandoned the fight, and the Jews were wiped out. They were wiped out. Now, many of the non-Messianic Jews who were looking at the Messianic Jews as people, compatriots, now saw them as traitors. And now they were suspicious of the movement. In fact, Richard Bauckham points out that that very incident is what caused a huge rift between the Messianic movement and the non-Messianics in, in Judea very early on. So they might have had political reasons not to agree with them. Plenty of reasons why not. In fact, here's an interesting fact. When Bar Kokhba was, was annihilated by the Romans, his followers refused to even acknowledge they knew him. So what you have in a Semitic culture, I come from a Semitic culture, I know what they're like. I know exactly what it's like. Our guy is the best guy, he died. Eh, I don't even know that guy. <laughs> and that's what happened. But you know what's different? Jesus is fundamentally different than the false Messiah. Fundamentally different. He was nailed to a cross in humiliating defeat in front of the Romans, and his followers didn't deny knowing him. Well, they did before he died, but not after. You have to explain the burgeoning early church. They didn't disown this man. Why not? Bar Kokhba died by starvation in some hole somewhere. Jesus arose from a hole somewhere. And that accounts for why his followers believed him and shouted from the rooftops and weren't willing to deny him, but willing to be crucified for his name. The statement of the prophecies. Well, I can actually give a couple of those things I think that are actually interesting responses. Uh, talking to my Messianic Jewish friends, by the way, who know their Hebrew, who know their stuff, and will tell you, oh yeah, there's plenty of Messianic prophecies uh, in there. I'll give you an example, the Isaiah 53. It's not about the servant Israel. It's not there. In fact, let me try to find it in my notes here so I can make sure to, uh, to oh, here it is, to make sure to respond adequately. Isaiah 53 has a subject-object distinction. There's an IU. This is the servant, and someone suffers for the servant. Well, the servant is Israel. Then Israel suffers for itself. The grammar doesn't work. In fact, Dr. Cyrus Gordon, a professor of NYU Hebrew, told a number of Orthodox Jews in his classes. He pointed out the grammatical impossibility of this, not being, a, of this being about G, uh, Israel, and in fact, it being about the Messiah. And in fact, Isaiah 53 refers, this only refers to Israel 
after a man named Rashi, Rabbi Rashi, in 13th century conjured that up. Up until that time, all the rabbis said it was of the Messiah, and the rabbis rebuked him for saying it was about Israel. Friends, there's plenty of reasons to believe in the resurrection, plenty of good reasons. We have eyewitness testimony. We convict people on eyewitness testimony of murder and other things and send them to, 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 uh, to jail or even to the gas chamber over this kind of thing. We have the eyewitness testimonies of the disciples. We have the eyewitness testimony of an enemy who becomes a Christian. We have all these kind of things that can convince us that's enough evidence for us to believe that the resurrection actually happened. We have to come up with some kind of weird um, story to say it didn't happen. That what accounts for them actually having seen something that convinced them Jesus raised. This is universally acknowledged, or at least close to universally acknowledged, by many critical and non-critical, or I shouldn't say non-critical, but critical and Christian historians who study the subject. They believe they saw something that convinced them he was raised. You've got to explain that. You can't just say, nope. You've got to explain it. Let me show you this on probabilities and possibilities. This is a statement. It's very similar to what John said today. The more Christians constantly retreat to what is possible in order to defend their faith, the more their faith is on shaky ground. Why? Because we want to know what is probable, not what is possible. If we ask Christians to defend a particular belief and they argue such a belief isn't impossible, then this is a tacit admission that instead of evidence supporting what they believe, they're actually trying to explain away the evidence. The more often Christians are forced into arguing their faith is merely possible in the face of contrary evidence rather than probable, then the less likely it is that their faith is true. Every time they do this, they are explaining the evidence away by admitting the evidence does not support what they believe. Probability is what matters. You know who said that? John Loftus. <laughs> now let's change the words a little bit so we can make sure that when we point fingers, we all don't forget that three point fingers point back at us. I've given you a great case, I think, with the probability of the resurrection, at least the best explanation of it. The more atheists must constantly retreat to what is possible, no matter how improbable, in order to defend their objections. He didn't say that last part. Uh, the more their objection is on shaky ground. Why? Because we want to know what is probable, not what's possible. If we ask atheists to defend a particular de objection, and they argue such an objection isn't impossible, then this is a tacit admission that instead of evidence supporting what they believe, they're actually trying to explain the evidence away. The more often atheists are forced into arguing their objection is merely possible in the face of contrary evidence rather than probable, then the less likely it is that their objection is true. Every time they do this, they are explaining the evidence away by admitting the evidence does not support what they believe. Probability is what matters. Friends, with that last statement, I think that's the reality of it. And I think the resurrection best explains what happened to Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Abdu's good, isn't he? Uh, that last quote, uh, I really appreciate when I'm getting quoted. It really makes sense. But remember, he turned it on around me as an atheist. But this was written by a Jew. See, an atheist would be anyone who disagrees with his Christianity. Michael Alter, then, is an atheist. He, that is, he's a non-believer. He doesn't believe in Christianity. So uh, apparently it applies to believers like Alter, a theist, a Jew, who wasn't persuaded by the evidence that um, Abdu is, is presenting. See, I'm not alone in this. Hindus disagree with him. Muslims disagree with him. Um, and um, I'm just here to report the results. <laughs> That's fun to do. Actually, I can read what Christians say and report the results. That's what I did when it came to the apologetic methodology. I just simply report, reported the results. Christians themselves are saying the things that I reported about method. Um, and uh, he talks about confirmation bias again. Uh, you know, first you have to have something to believe for confirmation bias to kick in. So a Christian, like himself, has a belief in Christianity, and that's when the confirmation bias kicks in. And what I've done in the Outsider Test for Faith book is to try to eliminate or nullify the confirmation bias so that we can all... Uh, apply the same standards to all religions across the board without it. And that is to look at your faith as an outsider would, someone who'd never heard about it before, and someone who's dispassionately trying to figure out whether or not it's true rather than confirm it. Because that confirmation bias is the mother of all biases. 
it'll, it'll skew the results every time if you have a bias towards confirming what you believe. And so uh, you should trust your religious faiths as an outsider, a non-believer, an agnostic. Test them all the same way. And if God cannot produce the evidence to convince outsiders, then uh, he didn't do his job. That's all there is to it. Uh, there'd be no reason to believe it if uh, the, uh, the correct faith could not pass that uh, test. Uh, now, I, 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 I do think there was some kind of Jesus that uh, died, uh, but he may not have existed at all. In fact, um, there's probably a better case that he didn't exist than he, that he was the miraculous Jesus we find in the Gospels and that he rose from the dead. And if Mark was uh, dictated by Peter, why didn't Peter dictate to him the resurrection sequence? John's gospel is unreliable. It's anti-Jewish. If you read the gospel of John, it could not have been written by a Jew. It's anti-Jewish because in the gospel of John, Jesus is reportedly saying, You're, you are of your father the devil. He's, not ta he's talking to Jews. It's clearly anti-Semitic, the gospel of John. That's why scholars don't believe the gospel of John was written by anyone close to Jesus. They're not a Jew anyway. The creed that he mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 where he's, he's talking about this ancient creed, uh, it doesn't mention an empty tomb. Now, why not? That's kind of significant. That's the number one piece of evidence that apologists bring up to four. Explain away the empty tomb, they always say. Explain away the empty tomb. Well, Paul never mentions it. I mean, you would think that if that was such a key evidence that uh, Paul would have mentioned it, and he didn't. In fact, when it comes to James, uh, someone who was converted apparently by a vision, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says... James saw Jesus just like I did. Uh, in fact, all these people saw Jesus just like I did. And in Damascus Row, we don't know what he saw. I mean, he doesn't say what he saw. He heard a voice. Uh, but in Acts chapter 26, verse 19, Paul said it was a vision. Acts chapter 26, verse 19. How many of you brought your Bibles here today? Come on, let's get, let's get a revival meeting going. Acts 26, verse 19 says, Paul said it was a vision. Now, we already know Paul has all kinds of visions. In fact, the, you know, the Lord's Supper was given to him by a vision, and the whole gospel was given to him by a vision. Uh, so it's not anything new. And I would like to... Um, see, when we, when we come to the New Testament, the age of Jesus was not an age of critical reflection. I'm reading uh, something that Richard Carrier wrote, a scholar of uh, ancient uh, Roman uh, era. He said it was an era filled with con artists, gullible believers, martyrs without a cause, repute, and reputed miracles of every variety. They had no newspapers, telephones, photographs, or public documents to consult to check the story. And then what we have, what we have is uh, what we have. We have no original texts. We have no firsthand uh, reports. You know, the things that I mentioned earlier, that's just not good enough evidence for me at all. I need something more than that if I'm an outsider. I need some, something tangible, if I could, uh, to, to accept that. In fact... Uh, I did accept it at one time, and I did have confirmation bias to believe it. And as a budding scholar, a budding apologist, uh, I did whatever I could to uh, support my confirmation bias. But even though I had the proclivity to believe what I was uh, taught, uh, I still was able to say, you know what, this is, this is wrong. And the, the, how wrong was it? Well, it was wrong, so wrong that I had to be sure I was right. And the reason why I had to be sure that Christianity was a delusion was because I always had that fear of hell thrown over me, like Abdu said uh, with the Muslim God as well. I had that fear of hell hanging over my head, that if I got it wrong, it, I would go to hell. So I had to be sure I was right. So there's nothing he said today that, uh, that uh, is important enough for me to reconsider how I've, I've come to what I've uh, believed, because it just isn't there. The evidence is just not there. Sufficient evidence is not there. Christian apologists say that. They, they come up with different methods because the evidential method just doesn't work. Just listen to them. Listen to them argue this case. The evidence isn't there, so let's come up with a different method. What does that tell you? Theism would never be around if the evidence was there. Reform theology would never be around if the evidence was there. The cumulative case would never be around if the evidence was there. Neither would classical, neither would, uh, uh, classical, uh, the classical method or presuppositionalism. None of those methods would be around if the evidence were there. Now, he's giving you the evidence. You know, oh, yeah, right, for that, that's fine. That, that's, that'll, work. that'll convince some, pe some people who already believe. 
because that's what evidence uh, leads to when it comes to Christians and apologists. It's all special pleading. Only those who already believe will believe it. There is no empirical evidence, no original text, no first-handed testimony, no prophetic evidence, contrary to what he said. We could get into that. And no corroborative evidence. The Jews were there. They saw. They, they, they were uh, beloved of God, and yet they didn't believe. He says, oh, I don't know, neither does John. Well, you know what? I do know, because I've examined the evidence pretty closely, as the, the Jews recounted, and it doesn't seem like the evidence is there. See, they had every reason to think that Jesus should have been the Messiah. It's just that they didn't believe that he was. They, they had every, every reason to think he did the miracles, but they didn't believe him. They had every reason to investigate the resurrection, and they, didn't, they, they went away not believing. They were there. They didn't believe. And because they didn't believe, they're my Johnny on the spot. They were there. They didn't believe, even though they saw everything that was available to be seen. They had every way to investigate it, and they didn't believe. That, so Paul had to take off and convert the Gentiles. There just isn't enough evidence to believe, and I leave two minutes to, to Abdu for rebuttal. <laughs> I got two minutes. I got, you know what, just want to sing a song? Uh, Kumbaya or something? I, got two, I, I can't believe it. I got two minutes, and I'm done. All right. Okay, uh, actually, you both are going to stand. Uh, microphones. Uh, this seven minutes are allotted for cross examination going back and forth between the two speakers. So, uh, once we can get this set up, then yes. And the way, well, I'll, I'll leave it uh, to each of you to decide which one wants to do cross examination first. Uh, but go ahead, Andy. Seven minutes piece. Sure. <laughs> no throwing of anything, John. Um, uh, John, in your, in your books and in other debates. And I'm glad I, you read them. And I, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, uh, in other debates as well, when I, I believe you might have said it, said it here as well, you made the statement today, in fact, you did say it, that the, the early ancient times was marked with gullibility and people who would just believe all, any old thing, right? Um, that uh, they, weren't they weren't critical thinkers and these kind of things. Yet in your book and in your debate with David Wood, you made this statement that the empty tomb had to be made up and the guard story had to be made up to convince people uh, of what amounted to a fantastic story. So here's my question for you. If people were gullible, why didn't they just believe when they said we saw a vision of Jesus? Why did they have to make up the story at all? If they were gullible, they wouldn't have to make up the story at all because they wouldn't be gullible um, they'd be critical thinkers. So why make up the story if they don't have to? Okay, all right. Well, you know what? Um, it does make it more believable if you have a made-up story. Well, why do you need uh, to make it more believable? Well, I understand your point, but uh, let's just say it did run across some people. I mean, not everybody was gullible. I never said that. Carrier doesn't say everyone was gullible. You said characterized by. The whole time was characterized by a bunch of morons, apparently. They were, they were pre-scientific people who were superstitious. They believed in an evil lie. Let me give you an example of what an evil lie is. Don't look at my eye because it's evil. And if you, if you look into my eye, I could, I could be emanating particles from my eye that might actually make you into a very self-absorbed person. They believed that back there. You can find it in the text of the, in the Bible itself. Jesus and Paul said as much. We can get the quotes out if you want. Now, those kinds of things are there. They believed in all sorts of things. So um, they, not everybody had the non-questioning... Uh, uh, gullibility, but it was, it was permeated by that, is the point. And I think that the stories grew in an evolutionary way, and, and things were added to it. I don't see any problem. Well, I, well, aside from the fact that in order to, if they were permeated by gullibility, then to create an entire story and circulate that in the Gospel of Matthew, and then cut, lie about the lie that you, need, that you lied about, just seems an utterly unnecessary act. If, in other words, your explanation is looking for something to explain. Well, you know, I, I, the one thing is that uh, Matthew has a story about guards at the tomb, and uh, Luke, a later gospel, denies that story ever happened. Because uh, in Luke's gospel... Well, it doesn't deny it. This doesn't include it. Well, uh, that's true. But he said in the, in the first... That's true. But he said in the very first two verses of his gospel, I've investigated everything, O Theophilus, and I'm going to tell you the truth of what happened. Leaving, he didn't say leaving nothing out, but he says, I'm going to tell you the truth of what happened. And then he ignored the guards at the tomb story, which was added for the gullibility of, of the choir, which Luke decided, eh, you know, we don't even need that gullible story because it can't be true. What the guards, because what did the guards see? Uh, you know, when were they placed? You know, mm -hmm. so Luke said, so let's go back to gullibility. We, we don't need that. He denies what Matthew uh, reported. And other than 
the way you've sort of woven that story. It's pretty got good. You, you, like, you like that? It's pretty good. Well, except for the fact that it's got no evidence for it. No, I mean, I think that's true. I mean, Luke denies what Matthew uh, included. Okay, because he didn't include it. Give me evidence of that. It's Luke chapter 1, verse 2, 3, and 4. So now you know how a trial works where uh, you bring up something to a jury? Or no, to I a, don't. Okay, well, I'll tell you how it works. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Just because you don't have all the evidence you'd like doesn't mean you don't have enough evidence. We would like tons of evidence. You know what I'd love to have? I'd love to have a video of OJ doing the deed with three people I watching it. I have it. I have it. I have it. It's in oh, my you, mind. oh, you do it. Okay, great. But doing that kind of a thing and, you know, photographs and witnesses who say they actually saw it happen, I'd love to have that. But the fact remains we had enough evidence to have that trial and I think reach a, reach a verdict that, you know, obviously wasn't the right one, but there you have it. We have plenty of evidence all the time. Trials don't work like I would like to have all this wonderful stuff. You need to have enough stuff. Now, what you've proposed with this gullibility story just doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to watch. It seems self-contradictory. Either they're gullible or they're not, but you're saying some are and some aren't, so we'll invent an entire gospel out of this. And Matthew and Luke writing monthly contemporaneously, I just don't see the connection. I don't see, in other words, the connection that you make is that Luke read Matthew and said, hmm, I don't like that story. What evidence do you have of that? Of that direct evidence that Luke saw Matthew and said, that's a bad story. Well, Luke said, look, Luke said himself, uh, I, I've investigated it and I'm going to tell you what happened. I mean, he, look, and you, you would quote that, wouldn't you? But to say that Luke's gospel is sure because he's, he's investigated until it comes to Matthew's story. Then all of a sudden you want to back down and you want to say, well, you know what, that didn't matter. Well, maybe, he didn't, maybe it didn't matter to Luke. Doesn't, well, mean, that, doesn't mean that Jesus didn't rise. Well, just because you know, Matthew you know has a story, doesn't mean Jesus didn't rise. I have a theory on why he didn't include it. It's because it's nonsensical. I mean, if the guards fell asleep when Jesus arose from the dead, then how could they say what happened? It, it is un nonsensical, nonsensical, so why not eliminate it from Luke's gospel? That's just a theory. I mean, so the, the, the it's guards it's no a longer theory matter. according the, to John Loftus. But here, but, I am John Loftus. But, but, but the, all we have is a theory according to John Loftus without any actual evidence. I just that, gave you some uh, reasons. Well... He gave me some reasons that you like, but I don't think that, I do like that, them. that actually uh, pertain to the actual evidence. Um, uh, <clears throat> and I think because further, I think they're right. Let me ask you one last question here because we have about two minutes to go, um, uh, and I appreciate the back and forth. You made the statement, well, a couple of questions actually. Um, uh, are you aware of the recent research by G.W. Houston on the longe longevity of manuscript evidence, of manuscripts, how long they last? Uh, you know, Christians write about 100 books to so the atheist one. So, well, uh, G.W. You know, Houston, yeah. do you know Let if he's know. an atheist or a Christian? No, I mean, okay. you can't keep up with all, you know, there's, a, there's a madhouse writing. Well, I'm books. just asking the question about right. this. Are you aware that he has done the research about the longevity of manuscripts and how long they actually last? Uh, no. Okay, well, they last about 150 years, maybe even a little bit less than that. They last a long time. Now, if that were the case, wouldn't it be also possible that the copyists of the New Testament weren't writing a fourth century document, but actually had possibly the first generation or second generation copies available to them? Oh, well, no. No, if you're saying, uh, you're saying, what, 150 years? If the manuscripts themselves last quite a long time, let me try to figure it out, 75 to 500 years. No, you'd have to have at least uh, one removed, yeah. But no. Yeah, that's my point. No, one removed. Yeah. The, the, thing, the thing is, that's if there were full manuscripts. We don't know that. We, all we have are little tiny scripts and, 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 and sayings and things like that. And you, you say, well, this one is a, the Bodmer papyri, and so therefore it was, we date that about 100 uh, A.D. And so therefore, and look, it matches with John's gospel, so therefore that proves John's gospel was uh, you know, written. No, we don't. All we know is that that papyri was, uh, you know, had, had a verse that matches John's later gospel. For all we know, it was a, a, some, a letter of some sort, of, so, of some kind that somehow got put into a, a later written co gospel called John. But you're aware that we have like almost entire books of the Bible in the 200s and the 300s, right? You know, P50, P, P45 and all these things. We can look in the online and see 11 manuscripts of, of Matthew, for example, dating between two and 300 years old, 200 and 300, 82 and 300, right? Well, well before uh, the fourth century. All right, well, let me ask you. you are you aware of Bart Ehrman's work on the, on oh, the you manuscript? Bet. Uh, oh, you bet. In fact, let me quote him for you. <laughs> we have a time. Oh, okay. You can switch. Well, he just asked me a question. Can I answer the question? You may answer the question. Okay. I so, have two minutes from my previous time. You can <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> so in the uh, latest edition, um, uh, the fourth edition of their standard introduction to the New Testament, Bart, uh, Bart Ehrman and Bruce Metzger comment as follows, that it would be a mistake to think that the uncontrolled copying practices that led to the formation of the Western textual tradition were followed everywhere that texts were produced in the Roman Empire. So in other words, people were 
have an uncontrolled copying thing in the Western text of the Roman Empire, but you shouldn't think that it happened everywhere. And they say this, quote, in particular, there is solid evidence that in at least one major city of early Christendom, the city of Alexandria, there was a conscious and con conscientious controlled exercise in the copying of the books of the New Testament. Textual witnesses connected to Alexandria attest a high quality of textual transmission from the earliest times. It was there that a very ancient line of text was copied and preserved. Agree or disagree? Are you saying that it was co-written with Metzger, yeah. Martin Metzger, mm -hmm. and when, was, when did that come out? This is the fourth edition, sorry, this is 2005. Page 277 well, to Metzger, 78. Metzger was Bart's uh, mentor, you know. Sure. And, and I, I, if they, if, if they co-wrote a book, I'm not so sure Bart in that book would uh, dispute his, his, uh, his mentor. What you need to do is re read his own uh, works on it, and his own works are much different than what Metzger uh, accepted. And so, you know this. Yeah, so, yeah sure you, do. So, so I'm talking about Metzger alone and not a co-written thing. You and I can co-write a book and we might, we don't, we'd have to stick with what we agreed to or something like that. And it, it, sometimes you have to like work on an agreement. But Bart Ehrman says all kinds of different things that uh, you, know, you wouldn't agree with. Yeah, uh, but then he'd be inconsistent with no, this no, 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 no. The, the controversies, the theological controversies about who Jesus was, was changed in the texts themselves. And, and what I'm telling you is that there's Bart a great, documents that. Yeah, and he also says quite the opposite, that the textual evidence was uh, 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 transmitted very, very faithfully from the earliest times. Metzger Seems says to that. me. Metzger says that. Well, uh, Bart Urban certainly didn't say, wait, 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 I've written a bunch of books that disagree with this. So should we, should we believe him then or believe him now? Which one should we believe? I, I, I accept what Bart Ehrman says, not, not what he has to agree to to, to uh, write something. So with he capitulates Carmester. when someone tells him to capitulate? Well, I, I don't know whether he does or doesn't, but I know. I Apparently, you think so. <laughs> Getting a feel. You know, it's not, it's not about textual okay. evidence anyway, it's, it's, it's about uh, miracles your, in history. Is it my turn? It's your turn. Uh, I, I, can I use my time just talking? No, all right, all right, fine, fine. fine. That's cross-examination, so all right, fine. however you wish to uh, It's about all the, all the converging the lines of evidence I mentioned earlier, and the fact that Christian apologists themselves walk away from sufficient evidence. I don't. Yeah, I know. And I'll tell you this, too. I'll tell you this. Um, uh, I was, I, I didn't want this to be true. Just like you, I mean, honestly, you and I are kindred spirits in one sense, and I really, I actually mean this sincerely. You walked away from a faith, and I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that that wasn't actually the easiest thing in the whole world for you to do. No, not easy at all. Yeah, and so did I, and it wasn't easy for me to do either. I think that one of the reasons why this debate specifically is very valuable for you and for me to have to be on this stage talking to these folks is because we share that. And I think we actually bonded over that a little bit in the car. Um, uh, yeah, this tiny car. I got a GPS after driving in your car. Yeah. I had to get one. Oh, let me tell you something. That, that, that's right. I am horrible. My that's wife first is time here. In a car She'll with tell a GPS. you. Yes. And uh, I, I want one of these things. So well, I, I got. I can get lost in my own garage. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I got a few questions. Uh, then let me ask you this. Um, uh, okay. Um, why are there other apologetic methods but ev evidentialism? Um, I don't know. I don't. You see, what the, the, the problem here is that what you've done is you've ascribed the fact that people disagree on the methods, and some are good, some are bad. Sure, there are different methods of, of scientific inquiry, too. Some are good, some are bad, and it doesn't mean that the whole enterprise of science is, is suspect. I would never say that. I don't think the whole enterprise of apologetics is suspect, either. Now, what I presented today, I thought, was based on evidence. I understand. So, so I clearly would, uh, would, would be willing to say, look, I presented you evidence. You can either believe it or disbelieve well, what, it. It's up you, to you. What do you but, make? But, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. You're, you're, a good, uh, you're a good lawyer. I can see that now. Monopolized time. <laughs> uh, he told me something about that earlier in the break room uh, over there. I think. I'm uh, loquacious. How he has to work. Uh, but no, well, what, do you make, what do you make of the fact that uh, most Christian, you know, in seminaries, they don't even have apologetics programs. They don't even teach apologetics classes. They That's teach theology, they teach uh, ministry, they teach ethics, they teach all kinds of things. They don't even have classes on defending the faith. What do you, what do you make of the fact that, uh, I just threw out some numbers, 83% was a thrown out number. I don't know how many embrace uh, which method, I know that. But what do you make of the fact that at the minimum, most Christian intellectuals disagree with you on the evidence that the, that the, the, that the Christian enterprise is supported by evidence alone. 
Uh, sufficient oh, evidence. Well, I, you cited some, and I appreciate your citation of those. I haven't read those statements, so I can't read them in their I'm not saying you're taking them out of context. Okay. I'm not accusing you of that. What I would say is this. When it comes to my own inquiry, just like your own inquiry, Alvin Planning, I can say the moon is green, made of green cheese. Alvin Planning is not my authority. I am the only person who can look at the evidence and say what I think it says. So I realize that that might be something worth exploring, and I'm happy to explore it and see the reasons why he says that. I don't have the reasons. You said it. I don't know what the reasons actually are. And as you know, reading Planning is quite the laborious effort, but I have my own reasons for All right, well, uh, I, I, I admire your honesty. honesty yeah, your, his, uh, his reasons are irrelevant to my, to my reasons. Okay, let me, let me read something by, by Bart Ehrman since his name has come up so much. Sure. Hi, Bart, in case you're listening. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read something to you and you comment on it, okay? Sure. Here's what he said. He's uh, coming up with a, uh, an alternative uh, su uh, supposition versus your, yours that Jesus arose from the dead. Suppose that Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea, and then a couple of Jesus' followers, not among the twelve, decided that that night to move the body somewhere more appropriate. But a couple of Roman legionnaires are passing by and catch these followers carrying the shrouded corpse through the streets. They suspect foul play and confront the followers, who pull their swords, swords at, as the disciples did in Gethsemane. The soldiers, exp expert in sword play, kill them on the spot. Now they have three bodies and no idea where the first one came from. Not knowing what to do with them, they commandeer a cart and take the corpses out to Gehenna, outside town, and dump them. Within three or four days, the bodies have deteriorated beyond recognition. Jesus' original tomb is empty, and no one seems to know why. He continues. Hmm? Is this scenario likely? Not at all. Am I proposing this is what really happened? Absolutely not. Is it more probable that something like this happened than that a miracle happened and Jesus left the tomb to ascend to heaven? Absolutely. From a purely historical point of view, a highly unlikely event is far more probable than a virtually impossible one. You comment on that? Sure. I, for, for the premise is flawed in its core. The idea that a miracle is by definition the least likely or impossibly likely, I think that's what he said, something close to that, I'm sorry if I didn't quote Vir it exactly. Virtually impossible. Virtually impossible is deck stacking and question begging. How often do miracles happen in your life? Oh, not very often. I mean, uh, that, except for the fact that the world exists and that I exist and that I have a conscience, it happens all the time. So actually. one. Yeah, everything existing, that's one. No, no, one, um, one time. Um, uh, but let me just say this. The, the point I is this. I hate lawyers, you know that. The, <laughs> the point is this, though. The point Judges is this. are good, though. Judges yeah. are good. <laughs> I'm going to say, wait a minute now. Let me, let me respond by saying this, is that the, flaw, the, the premise is flawed because he's, he has this sort of according to Bart Ehrman definition of a miracle. I could define it as something else. I could define a miracle simply as the violation of the laws of nature by the intervention, intervention of a deity, probably as a result of a, a religiously charged um, environment. Now what that means is, is that I don't have to assume that God exists to believe that a miracle happened to Jesus. The miracle can get me to God second. I don't have to assume it, because if there are acts of God, then there's a God who acts. That simply just seems to me to, be, to make sense to me. So when Bart Ehrman provides a story, which he admits has zero evidence for it, and then I see the counter story have way more evidence for it, I'm perfectly within my rights to say that rather than saying dismissively that a miracle is de by definition the least likely, I could say it's just at least as likely if there's good enough evidence for it. I remember, remember the Jews would look at that same scenario and agree with Bart Ehrman. I mean, they're the atheists too. They would say, you know what, that is more likely than that, uh, you know, Jesus rose well, from have, the dead. Yeah, I have two responses to that. The first one I already gave in my rebuttal is that there's a bunch of reasons why people don't accept things. There's actually a political reason that I can offer that actually has evidence for it, not just they don't believe and who knows why not. I know why. I have a good sur some, uh, some surmising of why they didn't believe, and the Bar Kokhba rebellion is at least part of that. There's a good reason for that. You have to include that. But the second thing is this, and you referred to Michael Alter's book. Michael Alter's not a historian, is he? He's a retired school teacher, right? Uh, no, no, he's a full time researcher into that. And, uh, he's Where? Hit He's traveled the world. He's, he's, he's in, uh, I think he said he's going to Rome. Uh, to Is he accredited? Is he a PhD? Well, that's the, that's the very first thing you'd want to know, okay? And I'm going to give you two responses. One, he's, his, the preface is written by a rabbi. He says incredible things about it, and I have read so it. So no. I've skim, I've skim read it, and I, well. No, it's 900 that's, pages, though. <laughs> of course you did. No, I, I don't have to read okay. a whole book to know it's good. And uh, I say, I say, that's true. Yeah. I say it's a good book. Okay. Everything, everything I read in it is a good book. We are, Thanks, we are at the point where we will now do uh, the uh, closing have read, statements. Have you read all my book? 
Uh, <laughs> closing statements to wrap things up. We'll start again with Abdul. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sitting here standing around like I don't have anything to do. <laughs> so there's this whole debate I have to get to. Um, well, friends, I hope you've enjoyed tonight. I know I have. John, uh, this has been a very lively and very fun. I'm really glad we got to do it. I think it's been actually interesting and enlightening. We do, long and the short of it. Um, we'll do that. Um, thank you all for being here. I hope you've enjoyed this. The summarization of the evidence is what I said before, the three things that I think the majority of scholars agrees on about the historical Jesus, that he died by crucifixion, that, he, that there was a, 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 something that caused his disciples to believe he had risen, actually risen from the dead, so strong that they were willing to suffer and die for that belief. So strong was that appearance that Paul the Apostle himself, an enemy of the Christian faith, becomes one of its, in fact, probably its greatest champion. I don't think any of that's been challenged today. Not, not one of it, not, not a bit of it. And so I think the evidence points in to the direction of the resurrection. It's the best explanation for what we have. Bart Ehrman's suppositions just aren't good enough. They're unevidenced, as he's admitted, and they just don't explain the evidence that we do, in fact, have. The ending of Mark, just to show, so, uh, talk about this very briefly. You know, when you look at the ending of Mark, there's a lot of um, theories about what happened at the ending of Mark, that it should have gone past um, the... Uh, um, the, the verses that does, in fact, end on. And let me show you, let me uh, go to this real quick, if I could. Um, let's see, sorry about that, friends. Uh, here we go. Um, at the ending of Mark, you see that Jesus appears, and he doesn't have any sequence after that. He's raised, the tomb, uh, that, that Jesus is raised. And he says to, the disciples, to his women followers, you know, go tell no one. But you see over and over again in Mark that he says, Don't, go tell no one. But then in Mark 5, 37, 9, 8, 9, 9, 10, 18, 13, 32, he says, don't do this, but, they, but except for this person. Go and do this, go tell this person. So Mark assumes, actually, that there's going to be a further appearance of Jesus to his disciples. In fact, earlier in Mark, he, Jesus predicts, I will meet you in Jerusalem. And then he tells the women followers, I'm going to be meeting them in Jerusalem. So the ending of Mark actually assumes that Jesus will be doing more appearances. It assumes it. I happen to believe, and some scholars believe this as well, in fact, a large number of scholars believe this, that the ending of Mark was cut off. There probably was more evidence there. Mark just didn't not mention it. Peter just didn't say, well, he rose, end. That's not what happened. The ending was cut off. We've lost that ending. But what we do have in that ending, what do we have? We have Peter saying, he rose, he rose. And the likely conclusion is that those women followers told him that he ran to the tomb, saw it empty, and Jesus appeared to him. The issue of prophecy, without going into more detail about it, I've already responded to that, but frankly, it's irrelevant to my case. I didn't refer to it one time, not once. So he, he attacked the hill and no one's defending. John would point the biased finger at Christians, saying that because of the confirmation bias, if the resurrection is even possible, despite being improbable, Christians would believe it. But the fundamental basis for this argument has been this. If any natural explanation is possible to explain the data, we go with that one over any plausible sounding arguments for a miracle. I think that if we come with a truly open mind, we could see that a miracle is one of the options. Is there evidence for that miracle? And I think I've shown you the evidence for that miracle. All of us have come to this debate with biases and desires. Some of us came hoping that I would do well. Others came hoping that John would do well. Others came hoping to find answers. But all of us, even if we say we just want answers, favor one outcome or the other. Let me ask you this question, friends. How different will be tomorrow be for you if you came to believe on the strength of this evidence that Christ rose from the dead? It would be a different day for you, wouldn't it? Of course, if you came to the opposite conclusion, it would be a different day as well. But if you rose from the dead, that's important. Friends, I was someone who didn't want to believe this. And sometimes we can look for comfort more than truth. C.S. Lewis said, who was once a skeptic himself, says, if you look for truth, you will find comfort. But if you look for comfort, you will find neither comfort nor truth, only soft soap to begin with, and in the end, despair. I think there's plenty of reasons to believe this. When I came to faith in Christ, accepting the historicity was going to be a problem. I resisted it for so long. The evidence compelled me, my mind and my heart. You see, Jesus died and rose from the dead, not in some, some abstract, maybe 
funny, like, academic way of let's see what happened to some strange Jewish guy 2,000 years ago in some rotten outpost somewhere in the Roman Empire. It has theological significance, friends. It tells you and tells me something. The cross tells you and tells me something. This message isn't relevant to you. You are relevant to God because your moral choices matter, and the cross is the statement with an exclamation point. What you do matters. But the resurrection says that he offers you life. The case for the resurrection offers you the assurance that giving your life to Christ is not a blind leap. The evidence tells you it's not a blind leap, but an act of trusting in what God will do for you based on what he's already done. Thank you. Okay. Closing statement from John. Thank you. Yeah, if you believe what um, Abdu has uh, presented t today, uh, then you're doing so because the story is familiar to you. You're doing so because you were raised in a Christian culture, probably by parents who were believers, usually. Or if not, you had a significant other, a close friend, a cousin, an uncle, or a church experience that led you to. That's the only basis for why you would accept what he's presented today. It's the only reason why he's accepted it, even though he's come from Muslim religion to Christian religion, because he's now, um, he, he's adopted a new confirmation bias. He already believed in God, he had to believe something. I, I'm not gonna try to discount his conversion, though. But the only reason you would believe that is because you're probably familiar with the story and because you were raised to believe it. And the open-minded person is, is, is the person who thinks like a scientist, who asks questions, who doubts, who, uh, who wants to know answers to questions. I want to know what Pilate thought. I want to know what Herod thought. I want to know what the rabbis thought at the time of Jesus. We don't have those things, so we cannot make that decision unless we know that. And since we don't know that, we shouldn't believe the propaganda of the Christian Gospels. How many of you, if all you ever read was Scientology literature, could walk away from it? How many of you, if, if all you ever read was Mormon literature, could walk away from it? And that's all you have in the Bible. That's all you have in the Gospels. That's all you have in Paul's letters and in, in the other legitimate letters are Christian propaganda. We don't have the other side of the story. Now, in the Jesus Gospels, all you see is Jesus de defeating one after another of his debate opponents. His opponents will come up and they'll say something and he'll give them a one-line answer and they'll walk away defeated because he finished them off. He had the final answer. They had no response. That's what you read in the Gospels every single time. Now, I have never in my life ever seen a religious debate that was settled every time by someone. There's always a response. There's always some, you walk away and you have some other kind of uh, objection and that was not stated, that was not recorded. We do not have any of those recorded. We don't have any of that. But I'm sure, as sure as can be, he didn't convince the people that he was debating. That's propaganda. Now in the Bible we find a world where there were gods and goddesses that ruled over specific lands and they had divine counsels to decide our fate. It was a world where God and his sons lived in the sky and people who died went to the dark recesses of the earth. It was a world where a snake and a donkey talked, the giants lived in the land, where people could live to be more than 900 years old, where a woman was turned into a pillar of salt, where a pillar of fire could lead people by night and where a sun stopped moving across the sky or could back up. Where an axe head could float, where a star could point down on a specific home, where people could uh, instantly speak languages or fo foreign languages, where someone's shadow or hand handkerchief could heal somebody. It was a world where a flood could cover the whole earth or a localized part of it, where a man could be swallowed by a great fish and live to tell about it, where a man could walk on water, calm stormy sea, or change water into wine. It was a world populated by demons that could wreak havoc on the earth and it would make people sick. It was a world of idol worship where human and animal sacrifices pleased the gods. It was a world where we find where there's visions and inspired dreams, prophetic utterances, miracle workers, mag magicians, diviners, and sorcerers. We don't live in that world anymore. There's no reason to trust the testimony that we find in the Bible because that world was part of that world. When I say that they were gullible, I mean just that, they were gullible. The results of our study, my study, my uh, uh, PowerPoint, there is no empirical evidence, there are no original texts, there are no first-handed testimonial evidence, there is no prophetic evidence, and I said it, I didn't know that he wasn't going to raise it up, usually they do. <laughs> 
<laughs> Usually they point out, well, there's prophetic evidence. So I was tried to uh, one-up and ship him, and now he's one-up and shipping me, even though, um, you know, I don't know how he turned that around on me, but somehow he did. <laughs> sorry, I'm uh, sorry about that. There, there's no corroborative evidence. The Jews were there. They didn't believe. I don't see why I should believe at all. Given the fact that most Christian apologists, apologists do not think there's sufficient evidence to believe, we shouldn't believe either. Now, if you want any of this corroborated on my side, read the two books that I mentioned. Go to the library if you're cheap. I don't care. The library has them. Check them out, especially the book, How to Defend the Christian Faith, Advice from an Atheist. See, I was one. Do you got that one yet? I should give you one. Um, thank you so much. Um, we will, uh, I will give you uh, some instructions and then um, we will take a very short break. Um, we will allow some questions and answers. Uh, hopefully, uh, fairly quickly, we'll give the uh, uh, various speakers two minutes to respond to any particular questions. I would ask that uh, those who might have a question uh, line up, uh, the representatives from uh, ARZM and uh, SSA will try and screen the question so that we can get everything uh, taken care of in uh, approximately the half hour that we have left. Uh, obviously, we want clear uh, questions to be presented, clear and concise statements, not uh, positions uh, imposed by uh, the speaker, uh, the questioner, uh, allowing these gentlemen to have a full opportunity to respond, hopefully for the benefit of everyone in the, in the audience. Uh, as you are doing that, we will take about a three-minute break, which will get us back on schedule so people can stand and stretch. I will try and get folks going again uh, fairly quickly because we have a limited amount of time uh, to finish up the program. But uh, at this particular point, if those folks who do have questions can get lined up with the uh, the screeners uh, so that that can be launched right into as soon as we finish our break will take three minutes. Thank you.
of the program. While you are uh, making your way back, I should point out that uh, this proceeding was live streamed, uh, rzm.org uh, slash live. And then for those of you who are into tweeting, which is something that is totally foreign to me, uh, hashtag rzim debate is the, the uh, handle, I guess you would say, with regard to that. So. Again, thank you very much for your patience, and uh, we will begin the process of questions and answers. And like I said, um, we will live it. Hopefully, if you can have quick, concise questions, uh, we'll give two minutes to the person to whom the question is posited to respond. So with that, we have, and if you could maybe give just your first name uh, any question. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Bethel, and my question is directed at Abdu. Um, as a trial lawyer, when you're examining witness testimony, you look for ways that they sort of incidentally or accidentally corroborate each other without looking like collusion. Could you give an example of that sort of thing as you look at the gospel, something that would indicate that it was natural eyewitness testimony and not simply, you know, Luke copying Mark? Oh, absolutely. Sort of I think that there are, are great reasons to believe that the gospels are filled with um, these, uh, these statements. As you know, there's these things called undesigned coincidences. An undesigned coincidence is when there's something, there's a bit of evidence that's left out of one gospel that's corroborated in another. And I'm trying to look it up right now. I have a couple of these actually listed. So if you'll bear with me for just a moment. Uh, sorry. Um, here we go. OK. Here's a couple of examples. M Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 to 2. Yeah, Herod is talking to his servants about who Jesus is and says he's the, you know, the reincarnation or the, he's John the Baptist, come back. Now, how would Matthew know that Herod was talking to his servants? Matthew wasn't there. Well, we find out not in Matthew's gospel, but in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 8, verse 3. Luke says that one of his women followers was the wife of Herod's servant. So how did he know what was going on in Herod's palace? Well. One of his women followers was the wife of one of Herod's servants. So the likelihood is, is that he told him. That's a corroborating uh, example. John 18, 36, Jesus says, then my servants would fight for me, essentially, if he was of, uh, a king of this world. And in Luke 22, why doesn't this bother um, Pilate? Why didn't he say, they already have started fighting for you? In fact, uh, uh, Peter lopped an ear off. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 51. He touched the ear of the man who, did, uh, who uh, Peter had hit, and he healed him. So there was essentially no evidence of confrontation at all. So that doesn't bother him at all. So another one, interestingly enough, I think it's in Luke's gospel. I'm going to get one of these mixed up. In Luke's gospel, when Jesus is being um, beaten, um, the, the guards are saying, prophesy, who hit you? Prophesy, who hit you? Well, he could just say, you, man, you. You're the one who hit me. So why did he say that? Why would he say, prophesy, who hit you? Well, you find out in the other gospel, I believe it's Matthew's gospel, they blindfolded him. So you see this cross-corroboration. When you have a witness who says a story, and it's not different, but it's complementary to another witness, that's the best kind of testimony you can get, because one witness who says exactly the same thing is colluding. Another one who contradicts is one of them is lying, or both of them are lying. But when they complement each other, ah, that's great evidence. Thank you. And on, my, on my view, uh, that last example, for example, uh, you know, people were asking, well, why didn't he say it? Well, the next gospel comes in and he solves the problem. Well, <laughs> we heard in a vision that he was blindfolded. That's how you solve it. You make stuff up. And as far as making stuff up goes, uh, when uh, Abdu said earlier that the Christians are now saying that there, is, there uh, was a longer ending to the gospel of Mark because there wasn't a resurrection sequence, uh, they're making stuff up when they say there was a longer ending to the gospel. They're making stuff up. There's no evidence for it. That's how you do apologetics. That's how you write gospels, in my opinion. That's not how I do apologetics, but thank you anyway. No, 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 see, see, uh, see no, nobody, nobody admits that's what they're doing, you see. Can I, in the time remaining, can I have a no. short response or no? No? That's okay, it's your time, John. I don't, I don't want to cut into it. Go to the next question. 
ahead. It's okay. Go ahead. Next question, please. Hi, good evening. Thank Hi. you both for coming. Um, my question is geared towards you, John. Thank um, you. My name is Carrie. I am a Christian, so I do come from that bias that you talk about. Um, but if Christ did not raise from the dead, then I, among all Christians, are most to be pitied. And why spend our life talking about this? But if we you know, are Christians, then we have a hope. But my question is... Um, why, why do you spend your life doing what you do if you don't even know, if, or if you don't even believe that Christ was really a person or that he at least raised? Why do you spend your time? Why do you care? Well, you know, I mean, because I care for people. I, I spent about uh, 40 years dealing with Christian, Christianity, first as a believer, then as a Bible college student, then a master's level student, then a doctoral student, then as a minister. Then, uh, you know, I studied and studied and studied. I became a doubter and an agnostic and then became an atheist. I mean, I've been, I've been very passionate about Christianity my whole life. And then the last, oh, I'd say probably oh, 10, more than 10 years, uh, I've uh, decided to share what I know. And the reason why I'm deciding to share what I know is because just like Abdu and uh, with, uh, with his former religion, you just, you, go, you come back out of, out of, and Plato has this analogy of the cave. You're in the cave and you see the light, and you go outside, you know, and, and you, 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 you see the day, and so then you care, and you go back into the, the cave to, to bring prisoners out with you. And that's why I wanna just wanna, I wanna help them. I wanna, I wanna help people so they don't spend 40 years doing what I've done. I, I've already spent my time, and, um, and another thing, I'm, I'm actually going to quit someday soon. So, I mean, just and then you can ask me that, why you spend all the time doing that? Well, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> Probably the next year or so. But, but you do believe that this life is all there is? I do. Okay. That's just, I'm very I'm gonna get to amazed I'm that you spend to... your time doing this thing, because I would be in the Caribbean all the time. Well, <laughs> um, you know, uh, tell me your name again. What's your name again? Don't walk away too fast. Carrie. Carrie. Uh, Carrie. I'll be there with you. <laughs> Carrie, great question. Um, and obviously, I can't respond to why John does what he does. That's his, his, his thing um, and why he does what he does. But I'll tell you this. The gospel message, I think, is, is evidentially true, evidentiarily true. But it also has an existential quality to it. And Carrie was hitting on this a little bit. You see, there is a great book by a guy named Clifford Williams called Existential Reasons for Belief in God. And what he says is that existential reasons or reasons that are relevant to your emotions aren't by themselves enough to prove that something's true. In fact, they don't prove something's true at all. They don't actually do it. But you are, in fact, warranted in your belief if that belief fulfills a need and there's evidence to back it up. So in my case, why do I do what I do? One is because I believe that you're a sinner and I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And that... And, <laughs> 24-hour uh, news is one of the worst inventions in the past 30 years. But I'll tell you what it does. Not only does it give you a bunch of, you know, uh, people just giving you their opinion constantly, but here's what it does. You want to know that human beings are in trouble, are inherently in trouble? Just turn on the news any time of the day. Um, it was Dick Mugridge who said that uh, original sin is one of the most hotly contested doctrines, but also the most empirically verifiable. Um, and we need someone who's not us to save us from us. That satisfies a need in each one of us. Apart from the evidence I already gave, which I think is substantial, there's a need that's satisfied as well. And so why do I do what I do is because I want to provide to you substantial intellectual answers that satisfy the heart. What we try to do is bridge the mind and the heart. Now, for some folks, atheism does that for them. It does. For some, maybe for you, John, maybe for other people. I've heard testimonies of the liberation. In fact, I debated an atheist on Thursday at West Texas A&M. And the chief reasons he said atheism helps him is because it relieved him of the stress of having to worry about God who's going to zap him. Now, that, that, that's fine. That, that's a personal reason, and I can't deny that reason. That's his reason. But I'll tell you this. That's not what the God of the Bible is. He's the God of the Bible who actually tries his best not to throw you into hell, but to save you from it. Hi, my uh, name is Joel. And my question is for John. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'd like to get clear on why you think miracles that involve explanations are um, the least likely explanation in any, in any circumstance in which they're invoked. It seems like that claim is ambiguous between two different claims. So miracle reports might be the least likely explanation because um, a miracle just is never a good explanation. It never satisfies certain explanatory virtues like simplicity, predictive power, unification, and so on. You might mean that, 
Alternatively, you might mean that a miracle report is always, it's, it's antecedently improbable. So its prior probability is just really low. Um, and so I guess I'd just like to get clear on which of those you mean. Do you, do you mean that a miracle report is just never a good explanation? It never, it never uh, has, it, it never explains the data as well as another hypothesis or just is antecedently improbable? Because and I mean, those, those are antecedent, rather different. Antecedently improbable. And I'll explain this, why. Um, uh, you're participating in what I call definitional apologetics you're, you're with your professor, Timothy McGrew. I'm sure you uh, have heard it from him. It's called definitional apologetics. If you can uh, get us reasonable people sidetracked into defining the precise moment when science is no longer non-science or when a, a, an extraordinary claim is no longer an extraordinary claim, then we've been sidetracked. We've been re we're going to chase that rabbit down the uh, endless rabbit hole. Um, here's what I want to say. Almost, well, every occurrence of a miracle in the ancient world turns out to be false. So, based on those probabilities, the resurrection of Jesus is probably false as well. You mean it's antecedently improbable? Yeah, but the antecedents come from all other known yeah. uh, mir miracle claims in the ancient world. There are a dime a dozen. I mean, you can read Rudolf Bultmann's book on New Testament. Uh, theology, and he has a, a long section of all the miracles that were claimed in the New Testament. No one thinks they ever happened. I mean, doesn't this just show? No one. Doesn't so in probability theory, we learned that to calculate the probability of a hypothesis given the evidence, you don't just look at the antecedent and probability of the hypothesis. You have to look at the way the evidence is predicted by so, the So basically special plead your case, you see, because all the other miracles are false, but I'm going to make my miracle out to be a special case because it has a story to it. That's what you're doing. All apologetics is special pleading when you say that Jesus is a special case. I would say uh, in my, well, he's got 27 seconds left. Should I wait? Oh, can I dance? No, please don't. Um, uh, I like to dance. I, I got two minutes now. Um, I'm going to not take two minutes, but I think that, you're, that, that this is actually onto something here because the prior probabilities, when you look at a Bayes' theorem thing, and I'm not even going to remotely get into the complexities of Bayes' theorem, we're all going to glaze over. Uh, you might not, though, because you seem like you've got a handle on it. Um, uh, but the prior probability is part of the calculus. The prior probability um, goes in with the background information, uh, the prior probability of something if, we, if without the miracle claim, all these various things. There's a huge calculus that has to go into this. You're not special pleading if you think that the prior probability of God's existing is unknown. You just don't know what it is. Um, uh, some might say that. You just don't know what the prior probability of God's existing is or that, that, that God will actually act. Because you're talking about also, in the calculus for a miracle, whether or not a free agent will actually do something. Well, I can't calculate the prior probability that you're not going to break dance right here. It's probably pretty low, just based on, on, on evidence, but based, based on my, my view and what you just said. But frankly, you're a free agent. There's a billion things you're going to do after you get out of here that I'll never know about. So the prior probability of what you're going to do when you leave here is just something unknowable for me. So what you should do instead of saying it's probably not going to happen, or it's very low in probability to say, I don't know what the probability is. Why don't I look at the evidence itself and work backwards from there and say, yeah. this is what I see. What best explains this? And it seems to me that a miracle, which I define not as the least likely event, but the intervention, uh, the, the violation of the laws of nature from the intervention of a divine being actually accounts for what we're seeing. I think science is a valuable tool. I think it's the kind of thing where we have to be a science denier for this. I just think that science applies to when nature is left to itself. We understand an acknowledged order, but a miracle is when it's not. And you can't calculate the prior probability of that. You can look at the evidence and then read it back into it. Now, maybe someone who has a Bayes' theorem sort of expertise can uh, explain that better. I certainly don't have that kind of expertise to do that, except I know something about Bayes' theorem enough to answer it as, you ha as I have. Sorry, that's a mouthful, but it's a, it's a great question. It's a great complicated question, but I think it's a wor one worth answering. Thank you. Thank you. Wait a minute. I'm detecting a pattern here. He always gets clapped. All right, fine. Fine. That's for you to start. <laughs> Actually, I think that was for the student. <laughs> That's fine. I, I, that's, all right, all right. Hello, my name is John. Hi. I'm a master's student here at Western. Congrats. Uh, and a scientist, so I was inherently on your side. Uh, but never argue with a lawyer. You're just going <laughs> to lose. Um, so, but my question actually is for Mr. Murray. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
we live in the information age today. Mm -hmm. Uh, we just got out of the atomic age uh, where information has been more pervasive than any other time in history. More people are literate, more people have access, free access to information in the last 50 years than the fi or 50,000 years preceding it. I don't think that's a controversial statement. No. In that period, I'm going to give you three quick examples. Jonestown, Heaven's Gate, the Branch Davidians. Each one had a leader who claimed to be Jesus Christ or a Christ-like figure who claimed and had followers who claimed to have seen miraculous events. And I would say, this is also uncontroversial, are probably these people are at least as educated or more educated about how the universe works than the most educated uh, people in Jesus' time. Uh, why is it, or what makes your story about a few plucky uh, underdogs uh, who just found their Messiah more probable than uh, Marshall Applewhite uh, David Koresh or Jim Jones, who all have followers who claim the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. They're still dead. Um, they're still dead. I mean, they died and they stayed dead. Okay. Um, uh, but, but, uh, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait, 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 wait. Let me answer your question, though, if you don't mind. You, yes. There was a, quite a long question. Let yeah. me answer your question. Um, and there's quite a long line behind yes. you as well. Um, so I think that's a fundamental difference, is that the, those followers, and by the way, the Branch Davidians didn't end up well. So no. their Messiah expectations were, were dashed. The Christians actually didn't end up well in one sense, but a lot of them did. You had a flourishing of a Christian church. Where are the Koreshites right now? They're gone. They're not there. Actually, they still exist. Well, in very, very small numbers and in scattered ways. The in Christian message. Wait, can you, is it okay if I finish now? Yeah. Okay. Um, the Christian message actually conquered um, the, the populace quite a bit, and it actually changed many, many people for, who were not only sort of succumbed to like the Koresh thing where you had the Branch Davidians and you had this FBI invasion of what happened there, and all of them died in this sort of fiery thing. Uh, you have Christians who are willing to go to their deaths based on this belief. The eyewitnesses themselves are willing to go to their deaths based on this belief. That's pretty strong testimony, if you ask me. Fundamentally different than the Branch Davidians as well. What well, about Jim Jones but let, but, or Apple? Oh, uh, Jim Jones. Watch the watch the, uh, the the documentary on Jim Jones. My goodness. Of his followers are you okay if I, I I can finish, right? Yeah. Okay, because I know you want to get at me, and I appreciate that. No, but I do just, you want to? Do you have a question, or do you want to fight? No, I, my question. My question wants to reflect reality. That which is that. Okay. Most of these people knew what the. So let's was let's be. let's let, let me now let me provide sure. my answer. So okay, I have forty seconds we left now. Um, when you look at the Jim Jones event, what you see is so almost all of those people. You see them crying and not wanting to do it, and there's interventions, and there's all kind of reasons. Jim Jones himself couldn't even kill himself, even his own his own his own desire to do this. He had to have somebody else do it for him, and then they killed themselves. There's all kinds of differences. You're talking about categorical differences. You're talking apples and oranges in these differences. They're just completely different. By the way, one last statement on the information age thing, and then we'll turn it over to John. We have never been more informed. We've also never been more misinformed, frankly. Uh, Tim McGrew and I were making a joke. He made a joke. He said, April 1st is the only day of the year when people double check what they read on the internet. <laughs> um, uh, That's uh, good. Yeah. And true. So let me just say this. We are, as a species, quite religious. I think it's actually, in one sense, and I appreciate what you're saying. I want you to understand. I appreciate what you're saying. I really do. But when you look at the majority of people around the world, they're religious believers of some kind. Now, are they right or are they wrong? That's one thing. But they're all very informed, intelligent people, and many of them are sitting in this place. To say that only unintelligent, gullible idiots actually believe in something is to deny the reality of this room. I think they're very intelligent people, and they have adequate reasons for their faith. The question isn't, should you believe because it's you know, scientifically untenable? The question is, does the science actually lead there? So I appreciate your question. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And I think you won on all counts. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Uh, I, would just, I would just say it's an excellent question. I mean, the, the point is, um, you know, without the information age, we wouldn't have known about these cults as easily. Uh, I'm a little more... Uh, grateful than, uh, than uh, Abdu is uh, apparently about the information age and I think that uh, uh, cult leaders had in the, in before the information age um, were a dime a dozen. I mean that's just, just matter of factly. So uh, it helps us du check and double check. I mean that's one of the reasons. We we're partly in the information age when it came to the rise of the Mormons. And um, uh, so we know for instance that his uh, tw his 12 witnesses uh, some of them recanted and they were close to him about the golden plates we we know that uh, what i want to know is the same kinds of questions we can ask and answer of the mormon church i want i want to have the same kind of documentation about the jesus movement we just don't have it and i'm not going to buy their story because of the mormon church's example 
So I think it was a good question. Okay. Got uh, time for really a couple hey. more questions at this point. Thank you. Hello. Okay. This is for John. I'm Jim. Jim. Um, if word of mouth and writings are not reliable because they're subject to gullible people, um, does that mean verifiable history onset only came at the point of modern photography? Well, um, no, no. I mean, uh, uh, the, I think the first historian, the, the first. Uh, the, the first historian, I think, was Herodotus, right? Uh, and he was, uh, he was a teller of tales, uh, you know, uh, something about uh, things flying out of a horse's butt, I think, uh, he reported. But, um, you know, um, you know so, so no, 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 that's not at all. That's not true at all. It's just you have to corroborate. You have to look for archaeological evidence. And, so, and some parts of some centuries have very little corroborative evidence. And, and, uh, and you find some disputes about things uh, that have gone on. And so it's hard to, it's hard to do history. It's really hard to do history. Um, and uh, with the, you know, do you know that there are less sightings of the Loch Ness Monster now that we have cell phones? There wasn't a single sighting last year. <laughs> Why? Because everybody's got their cell phones out there. Their, their, their business is drying up over there because of the cell phone. So I uh, welcome the cell phone and the, and the pictures, <laughs> and I wish they were back in the, in the day of Jesus. You know, we just don't have that. And it doesn't mean it didn't happen just because it wasn't there. But uh, because it wasn't there, I think there's more reason to doubt. I think I, I agree with John on a couple of things on this point, and I think this is, might surprise you, actually. <laughs> no, um, I think we agree on something, John. Um, uh, and that history is very, very hard to do. It is very hard. If there's historians in this room. Your, your job is a difficult story because, a difficult job, I should say, because you've got to piece together what happened based on the evidence available to you. And by the passage of time, we have some very serious uh, gaps sometimes in some things. We have huge amounts of gaps in manuscript evidence, for example, about Julius Caesar and the Gallic Wars. We have these like, something like 900 years between when it happened and when the first copy we have of the Gallic Wars actually exists. But here's the interesting thing. What we don't do is say, well, then we should doubt Jesus, Julius Caesar and what happened. We don't do that. We actually look and say, this is the best evidence we have. With the Gospels, we have way better evidence than that. In fact, one scholar actually called it embarrassment of riches how early the, the documents are and how numerous the documents are when it comes to the early church um, and what happened to the early church. Um, and what I pointed out was the very hard work of history, the very hard work of history that led people to say that Jesus died by crucifixion. There was a guy named Jesus. That's a very fringe idea that Jesus didn't, didn't even exist. Um, but the, the overwhelming scholarship of people who do hard history say that Jesus died by crucifixion that, he, that his disciples claimed he appeared to them and that it was so strong that it converted the skeptics, Paul and James, uh, and, and so on. Um, and I quoted scholars who are not friendly to the Christian faith, Gary Ludemann, Paul Fredrickson, Rudolf Bultmann, just to name a few, and there's many others who would say that that history, the hard job of history, we can know something and we can know, and they said historically certain that this is what happened to them. Hello, I'm Jordan. Uh, my question is for Abdu. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering, since like the technology age and the age of cell phones and being able to record, I was just wondering why have miracles happen as of late, as of someone become resurrected three days after they die and people turn to salt and all that? Sure. Um, well, a couple of reasons why I think this is the case. And uh, in one sense, this is going to be just me kind of surmising why you don't see it in the sense you do. Remember what you're seeing with the Gospels and with, 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 with the... Um, with the uh, Old Testament itself. You're seeing a very narrow view of certain people in certain times in certain places who are talking about what happened to them. And there's a special, significant, uh, um, religiously charged atmosphere there. So you see these miracles to effectuate a purpose. That purpose has been achieved. The purpose essentially was to get the Messiah to be there, to come, to die on the cross, and to rise from the dead. Purpose achieved. Now the perpetual miracle, of, I think, of creation and the fact that we do see it, you're, you're literally standing in the middle of a miracle. You're looking at one. Every time you look in the mirror, every time you see the wind blow, you're seeing a miracle. I think the fact that existence even has any substance to it is, screams out for a designer and screams out for a first cause. Um, so I think that that is uh, an important evidence of a miracle. We're seeing it every day. But the, the actions have been completed in the one sense of Jesus uh, dying for the sins of the world, and now we just propagate 
the miracle that already happened. We don't really need any more for that purpose. But I think this as well. I think there actually are evidences of miracles. Um, uh, I know John doesn't like this book, but I'm gonna recommend it to you anyway. Craig Keener's book on miracles, two volume set. It'll break your arm to carry it, but it's a pretty um, thick book and he goes into it. Whether you buy it or not is another issue, but Craig Keener talks about the survey of miracles around the world. Let me give you an example of something that was recently shared with me. I have a friend, his name is Caleb, and his wife, his name is Jody. She was diagnosed with lymphoma very recently, last year in January, I believe it was. And she had lymphoma. The blood work came back. She's got lymphoma. She's, lymphoma is no laughing matter. She gets tested again, I think three or four months later. And, the, and I had actually have the medical report um, where he shared it with me that says something like, there is no uh, cancer in her whatsoever. And by the way, what we see is oftentimes the result of radiated blood. She had no treatments, not one, not one treatment. Now you can say, oh, they got it wrong, or they goofed it up, or whatever it is, but we need to investigate the claim. That seems like a pretty strong claim. Now, maybe there's explanations for it, maybe there's not, but I think these things do happen. We need to look into these things. Um, and in the information age, maybe we'll find some uh, more stuff. Craig Keener's on, on the prowl for these things as well. So anyway. uh, These kind of miracles are usually taking place in the uh, South Southern Hemisphere and, um, and uh, South Africa and, and uh, I mean in Africa and, uh, and South America. Um, Philip Jenkins has a book called The New Face of Christianity and he talks about their attitudes towards miracles and they're open to them. I mean they, they're, they're from tribal sorts of places where there's demon, demon activity and there's uh, spiritual warfare and things like that. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not happening so much in America because we're more technical, technologically uh, savvy. Um, and um, it's really kind of a strange kind of phenomenon, I think, that it's, that's there and not here. Um, and the stories that are made up, you know, I used to be a Pentecostal. Uh, you, know, I used to, you know, my very first years as a Christian were, were as a Pentecostal. And I remember specifically one girl saying she was healed of epilepsy. I mean, a friend of mine, right, in Fort Wayne. And uh, I was inquisitive. I said, well, praise God, you know, and uh, tell me more. And she says, well, I went to this healer, and then I got healed of epilepsy. Well, that's sweet. And, and uh, she said, but I still have the symptoms. That's the punchline. <laughs> uh, I, I, even, then, even then, as a Pentecostal, I was saying, what? <laughs> Are you saying, yeah, I still have the symptoms, but you're healed? Yeah, I got symptoms. OK. So what's the difference between now and then? Well, I've got to claim the symptoms in the name of Jesus every day. Oh, so you're not healed. Yes, I am. I, I tell you, the twisted logic of believers with miracles stunned even me when I was a Pentecostal. I have been a Pentecostal. I've been to faith healers and, uh, he healings. My aunt uh, had polio, and she went to plenty of faith healings uh, by by her, uh, her mom, my grandmother, and I've never seen a, a, a healing. I've never witnessed one. I was open to them, and it never happened. So it's interesting that it doesn't happen here. And even among Pentecostals, um, uh, you know, it, it didn't happen for me. Thank you both. Thank you. One, one last question, sir. Thank you. I wanted to thank you both also. My question is for you, Mr. Loftus. My understanding of your position on the resurrection is that Mark is the original gospel and everybody else essentially borrowed from it? Is that? Well, they correct? borrowed the significant parts of it. I mean, there's Mark and Q. He mentioned Q and Q, which is the original document that Mark may have draw, drawn from, probably did draw from. There's no resurrection either. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so my question is, if that is true, how is the virgin birth explained? Well, there's no virgin birth. What do you think? I'm, I'm going to be duplicitous here? I mean, no, think, think about this, for instance. I mean, supposedly Jesus was a, a descendant of Joseph, uh, you know, who was a descendant of so-and-so, back to David, back to Abraham. Well, if God's semen was what did it, then Joseph was not the father. He couldn't have been, he couldn't have been descended from David, now could he? Jo Joseph was descended from David, at least that's what's written. Right, right, right. And, but Jesus, there's no, there's no part of him that, see, they could, what they thought back in that day was that, the male seed entered the woman. They knew how, the, they knew how to do that. <laughs> Woo uh, but what they thought was that the male seed did all the work, and the woman's womb was merely an incubator. That's all, that's all it was used for. Put the seed in, and the woman spits out the baby. It's my baby. I'm the father. 
And I hope that, uh, you know, it's a boy, not a girl. And the woman's job was just to spit out the baby. Now, if you didn't spit out the baby, something's wrong with you, because I gave you everything you needed. <laughs> but in the, Mary's case, apparently, it was God's semen. And, the, you know, this is incredibly, uh, it's, it's incredibly uh, insane type of argument uh, to say that then Jesus is the, the descendant of David. He couldn't have been. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, uh, so now we're talking about, uh, now we're talking about sex. A couple, couple of things is, is that um, Jesus being the descendant of David, first of all, one, that's, that's figurative in one sense because of the Davidic Messiah. That's a figurative statement there. Oh, no, why? Are they, and, they have well, all those genealogies. I, my turn, right? No, I've given up my time. I get the time. <laughs> so you have, you have, you have this Davidic, uh, you have this symbolicness that, that, that's there. And by the way, Joseph goes back to this. And so you see that there is a Jewish genealogy, there's a Greek genealogy. Luke goes back to Adam. That's special. Wait, hold on. Pleading. I didn't do it with you. Um, Luke goes back to Adam. Matthew goes back to David. Uh, and um, you see the way in which they do this because there's, there's actually directly talking about what's important about Jesus. He's the Son of Man and the Son of God. Um, this whole idea of injecting this word in there that suggests that somehow it's making it tawdry and the, and, and the idea of the virgin birth sort of tawdry and weird. I just don't, uh, first of all, I object to it. Second of all, that's not what happened, is that the, 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 the virgin birth, to me, a couple of things. One, the sources. I think Mark's gospel, and the majority of scholars agree with me, is based on Peter's eyewitness testimony. Um, the ending thing doesn't bother me in the slightest because you can see the indicia that, in fact, was supposed to continue. Uh, there's plenty of evidence, internal evidence of that. John's gospel, based on a disciple of, 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 uh, of Jesus. Luke's gospel draws from Mark, sure. Matthew draws from Mark, but they have their own independent sources as well, and I think I've demonstrated that. So there are multiple sources. But the idea of the virgin birth is simply this. If there's a God who can create the universe from nothing, creating something in the, in, in the womb is cake. It's a cakewalk. I don't think any reason to doubt that if you, can believe, if you can believe in a universe that sprang from nothing and nothing does nothing to nothing, but you believe that nothing did something and suddenly there was everything, we have competing absurdities here. It seems to me that one, that an, eight, that an uncaused cause is the one that moved this whole thing as opposed to nothing doing anything at all. But there's so many in historical inaccuracies in the infancy narratives themselves that there's no reason to believe it. And Mark's gospel was the first one. He never mentioned it. So. With that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Abdu and John, for your presentation. Thank you for your participation, audience. There are uh, representatives from uh, each of the student uh, organizations that co-sponsored this event. There's material out in the lobby if uh, you are interested in additional uh, materials. Thank you very much for your patience and for your attention and for your participation. Uh, with that, I will declare this hearing adjourned <laughs> and safe travels home. Thank you. <laughs>